Books Online. Got Alyssa. I think that's all we're expecting. Recording in progress. All right. We're going to call the meeting to order. This is the Randolph Select Board. Uh, first up is public comment. This is comment on anything that is not currently on the agenda. So, uh, hang on, you, hang on. Okay. Uh, here in the front row. Yep. Just identify your. Oh, yep. Do I need to get up and stand anywhere? Okay. No. Uh, my name is Nancy Hutchinson. I am here representing Little Sunshine Child Care Center. Uh, you're here on the ARPA stuff. I'm on the ARPA. It's okay. on the agenda. Okay. No. Yep. Just wanted to know. John. Uh, John Pimentel, East Randolph. Um, we have been missing our, our road sign for since 2019, and, and we'd like a new one. Did you reach out to the town road crew foreman? Uh, this will be the fourth time I've reported it to the town. Um, I haven't spoken to the foreman. No, I don't okay. have his number. But I've reported it to the town. Um, plus, there is a covered bridge whose name escapes me. It's off of Route 14. Before you get to South Randolph, Hydro. that hydro oh, yeah. that has been damaged for two years, the, the face of it. A truck hit it two years ago and tore off quite a bit of the face of it. And it's kind of unsightly, and it would be nice if it was re repaired. That roadside, Edson Road? Yes, Edson Road, E D S O N. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone online? Not seeing anyone come off. All right, I move to for approval of the agenda. <coughs> I will move approval of the agenda. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, consent calendar. I will second. Second. <laughs> Seven seconds delay. <laughs> All those in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 Opposed? Next up is new business, and we'll start with the errors and omissions and homestead changes. Okay. Mimi is here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mimi from the Worcester's office and assessor. Um, this is just to inform you about the homestead changes that have taken place since. Um, we launched the grand list. Yep. So we have. We really so. Um, I researched it. We don't need your signatures or <coughs> approval for the homestead changes. Um, just need to inform you that they happened. Informed. <laughs> Informed. <laughs> Great. Next up, we'll discuss the townwide reappraisal. Next steps: request for commercial income and expense reports. Yep. Uh, my name is Ryan Sylvester. I'm the project supervisor for the reappraisal. Um, so I'll also take an opportunity right now just to give you guys a quick update on where we are with the project. So uh, to date, we've inspected the interiors of 750 homes out of 1,500 and change improved parcels. So we are running about a 50% entry rate, which is Astonishing! It's great. That's awesome. Uh, community, um, you know, uh, cooperation and, and improvement with that. So um, it's really encouraging. We're going to send out reinspection letters this winter for all the people whose homes we haven't been able to enter yet, um, or if we've had scheduling conflicts. So we'll have more appointment schedules and hopefully get that percentage a bit higher. Um, we'll be done with the the initial residential data collection by I'd say the end of January, and I'll be completed with the commercial data collection um, by the end of February. So that brings us to how we would um, aim to value all the commercial property in town through the income and expense approach, where we'd be sending out um, inventory request forms to all the commercial property owners in town, requesting how their property in real estate makes and costs them money. So how much is landscaping, plowing, utilities, versus what's the rent of the real estate that comes in. So we're looking for rent rolls. That's the one, uh, that's the only data the state allows us to keep confidential. So when we're looking at rent rolls, it's the most accurate way for us to value commercial property. 
because when you when you sell a commercial building, you're selling th that building's ability to make money. So a lot of people confuse that with we're asking for what the business within the real estate is, is doing, you know, financially, and that's we're not interested in that at all. The business within the real estate means nothing to us. So just wanted to kind of get that on the record. Um, typically when we send these out, because no one's ever sent them out before, it stirs the pot a bit. Um, so that's kind of the reasoning for me to be here tonight to give you that overview and also field any questions if you may have them. So you use the word inventory. Yep. What's that? So the state has inventory request forms, so it would be the same thing for solar. When we value solar, we have to get information from the owner in order to use that data as a worksheet to come to a value. So um, it would be the same thing for gravel pits, too. We send out inventory request forms for gravel pits. Um, for their length of the project, the type of material, uh, how many yards per year, so on. So it's based on that same methodology. So it's basically the income and expense inventory form basically has two columns. Um, what were your expenses for the year on the property? Do you have any capital? Do you have any capital retainers? Do you have uh, capital funds? And what was the income generated from the real estate on the property in the previous year? So I would caution you not to use the word inventory. Um, in prior years, there was an attempt to put an actual inventory tax in play, and yeah. that really got people pretty riled up. So I think a topic that's already going to get them excited Our, might have a little fuel added to the fire with that word. But we can just call it an IME questionnaire. Yeah, you know, or just yeah. call it something that gives them that, gets you the data you want without any, you know, applying. Sure. That it has anything to do with their business inventory, per se. Yep. No, I, I heard um, that. Okay. I think you're right. I think it is going to fire them up. What if you own the property? Like so, you don't rent it, you don't have any rental so capacity there. So there will there will be there will be a disclaimer pretty much at the top saying please fill this out to the best of your ability, because if you are owner occupied, it is it's going to be really difficult to yeah. to fill that out. You're not going to keep track of those of those financials year to year if you're owner occupied. But at least the expenses. So what we you know with your owner occupied, we can at least get a good expense, you know, um, uh, quarry from you. So we can kind of average, keep averaging those out. So is that commercial? How do you define commercial? Is that um, rental homes too, like multi-unit apartment homes, or is that just? Yeah. So we'll be we'll be sending them out to actual apartment buildings. So like any, I think you have a yeah. handful of them. Um, I don't believe we're not going to be sending them out to multi-unit to multi-unit homes. We'll we'll kind of be able to look at. Um, we have a lot of other ways to look at rents for those for one, two, three bedroom units in town, stuff like that. So it would be, you know, industrial buildings, Shaw's, um, you know, your your auto auto garages, stuff like that. Yeah. Just so we can gauge who will be calling. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So you have approximately a hundred I have a hundred you have hundred and ninety six commercial commercial coded properties. So And how long do you expect that will take? So we're at the end of February, right? Sending those out. So well, so we're going to send them out in January. We like to send them out right at the okay. beginning of the year because that's when a lot of folks are getting prepared for their taxes, and it coincides. All the same information coincides with that. Um, the physical data collection that I'll be doing will be concluded by February, where I go and measure all the buildings, inspect the buildings that I'm allowed into. Okay. So, it's just it, income and expense is the most accurate way for us to value commercial. We can value by cost and sales approach. I think there are a couple decent, you know, commercial sales in town, but it will be hard to get the industrial buildings and stuff like that. So. And then walk me through the rest of the timeline. So you have that data. Mm -hmm. You'll have try to get into as many of the 750 remaining residential properties. Yep. And at what point do you start crunching the numbers to have new values that go out to 
Sure. To everyone. So our deadline for the sales analysis window is April 1st, 2024. So it'll be April 1st, 2021 to April 1st of 2024. So we're already crunching numbers. We're already looking at the sales that have that have happened in town, um, and we'll just keep following them uh, right up till that April 1st date so we get as, mu as many sales as we can use. Um, May, pretty much April, May, June. So end of April, beginning of May is when we'll be sending out our preliminary value notices, which will then give um, all the residents information as to how to schedule informational hearings with us New England Municipal Consultants, so we're going to add an informal level of appeal ahead of a, the, your formal town grievance process. Um, and those will be held <coughs> mid-May, and that will pretty much be ending the process for, for us, and that's when we'll hand it back to Mimi, the assessor and listeners, for them to handle their formal grievance, which we will be a part of as consultants, but we'll have no decision-making we're, we're just there to basically say this is what this means interpret interpret the information okay and the commercial side will have their values at the same time yep all values okay. will be re released at the exact same time yep okay any questions on that sorry i want to get the process all the way through so people knew when sure. to expect that yeah. that letter that everybody's going to go what <laughs> <clears throat> yeah the the, the, the biggest point I just want to, to make with the income and expense questionnaire is that we're not valuing the business within the real estate we're just valuing the real estate as a business so in, in class they say you're not valuing the item on the shelf you're valuing the shelf okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. any other questions no? great thank you yeah, you're welcome Next up is a grant application request from Kimball. Any questions on that request? Any motions? Just please be aware there are, um, this is Amy from Kimball Library, there are two grant application requests. On those in our yep. Yep. Both are in there. <clears throat> the first one for fluorescent um, tube light fixture replacement with LEDs um, seems straightforward enough and really worthwhile, so I would, I would move to approve that grant to grant application. I will second. <clears throat> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And you've got the Paul Bruin grant, which is another one of the tasks you've given Amy a couple of, that was a while ago, was to see what funds could be garnered out yeah, there from grants that's... and others. Mm -hmm. so this is another source of funding for that project. I will move the approval of the, the Bruin grant as well. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next up is the Borac grant you, for Amy. park space you, at Branchwood. Yep, this is, uh, let's see if Mark jumped on or not. Um, and some other things going on tonight. One of the things we can apply for for Borac funding, we've usually used it for trail or trail related stuff. The HUDS program, the Bellamont one was last year's application. We've had good success with these grants. This would be for taking, I don't know if you go back to when we had a presentation on the Branchwood scoping study that Two Rivers put together on kind of the long smokestack parcel. There was some public park space that was shown on one of the site plans, kind of on the Pleasant Street end of it. So this would be for scoping, engineering, construction and design, bid documents, basically to queue it up if we wanted to go forward with an actual implementation project. So the work funds would go toward those pieces to take that from that initial, very conceptual site plan all the way out, theoretically at least, to something we could go out to bid for. So that's what the application would be for, would be for those two pieces. So tonight they're just seeking approval to apply for the grant. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can, when can Hang we on just a second. Discuss anything. Oh, well, it's a little. So. 
Any questions? She just must have moved or made a noise. No, it sounds great to me. Okay. You had a question about the Borat grant? Uh, I just want to uh, inject that this has nothing to do with the ARPA funding, that proposal that was initiated by the ARPA committee. It's got nothing to do with because there was that one proposal that said they wanted to create a park there. So it's got nothing to do with that. No. no. Okay. Different group. Similar idea, different process, different funding source to the I will uh, <coughs> make a motion that we um, uh, approve the grant application process for the Borough Grant for Park Space at Branchwood. Second. Second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Discuss and review the ARPA list between the committee and the town's lists. Yeah, so as a reference in the packets, kind of the next steps for you all, 2024 is the year with which we've got to obligate funds. So figure out where we want to spend them, or at least where we want to send them in the direction of. 2026 is the deadline to actually have them spent. And there are a couple of different ways to view that based on guidance from everyone from VLCT to Two Rivers. So this is just to try and um, come back to this conversation. So in the packets, you've got the list that the committee looked at just with their priority rankings. And we can go back through and pull any of the associated costs with that and or see if we need to develop any. Um, and then there's all along from the very beginning, your very first conversation with me at least about ARPA, going back to I think it was May of 2021, we talked about the town list as part of that. So the projects that probably aren't going to come in through a public solicitation, but that fit that ARPA criteria as it was originally designed. So um, sustainability, participation, how do you, continuity of operations if we had another pandemic or similar event, water quality, those are all in that bucket. Um, in addition to there's discretion on how to you spend those funds even beyond that that was some of the you know, the second round of guidance I guess once everybody started to ask questions about that so we've developed that list for you to look at too um, and then the idea is just to start that conversation again so that you can get to the point where you need to obligate funds in 2024 and then once we've figured out where to obligate it also helps us at a staff level figure out if there's a mechanism that needs to be created in terms of if money's going to an outside entity and or it's for there's ideas for community grant programs and some of these other things how can we set up a process for that so when it's time to spend it we're ready to do that should you make that decision identify any issues there um, that's a mechanical concern but that's a that's in that pipeline but comes a little bit later so what you have are those lists they're in the packets I don't know if we want to Go through them. Um, some of the ARPA funds have already been spent. If you go back to last year's police conversation, we dedicated two hundred thousand dollars to startup. When we found ourselves in that spot suddenly about a year ago. Um, we spent a little less than one hundred and seventy thousand of that. And there's thirty that returns to that general ARPA pool, which was always the intent. Anything unspent would return. Um, back in late spring, early summer, you provided $100,000 to the Orange County Parent Child Center project when they had um, cash flow need might be the easiest way to think about it. And um, that was the number one ranked priority on the ARPA committee's list as well. So the decision was made, even though we were a little bit ahead of the curve with all the other projects, that that was a, um, a moment of synthesis that we could maybe spend the money. So there is 300 or 268 that's already been spent on that total amount. So, let me just see if I can find my sheets here. So yeah, we got an award of about 1.37 million. We spent, like I said, um, 268,000 and change. So there's about 1.1 remaining for allocation. And then I think, as you can see, just from looking at the town's list and trying to envision what some of the costs of the projects would be on the committee's list, that we probably have more requests than we have money. Some of what is in here to talk about to keep in mind, and you may want to go a different way, but we've got it in the town list for now. At some point, we're going to have to make a match towards the FEMA-related costs for the July storm. That was never obviously in our mix because we don't forecast natural disasters of that magnitude. 
but we're going to be responsible for 12 and a half percent of that. We don't have that kind of cash just laying around. Um, and if we take it at one of the more conservative estimates, we might be up around 375, could even be up closer to four. If for some reason some of those unknown costs are more expensive than we think. When we're talking about remaining costs, it's North Randolph Road slope stabilization. That's that little section off Lincoln Ave. And we have some estimates for that. But the big unknown is what do we do with the North Randolph Road bridge? Temporary bridges in place. That could be a substantial project. That'll be one that'll determine probably that final number in terms of what we're going to have to make 12.5% of as a match. So I put that in here. It may not be the most aspirational use of those funds, but this is a funding source that is available that we could use for that purpose. Um, so that's kind of the biggest single chunk when you look at the town's list. The other one is embedded in some of the uncertainty over the town's um, conversation of leasing. I'm just showing you what three cars would cost. That's how we paid for the other three. Two need to be replaced. There need to be a new one. Again, this is just all to put it on the table. I know there's some push pull about those funds, district versus town wide need. So I get that. Some of the other projects on the town's list are what we said we were going to do all along. Try to figure out how to use the funds to put us in position to um, better compete for grants um, for bigger dollar projects. So how do we go out? If there really is more money out there than there's been in a long time, can we go out, get those funds, manage those funds? So bigger projects um, with bigger impacts, public works style projects, and we look to spread them around. Water quality is a big one. In order to get it as a town-wide benefit, we know we have road segments um, that don't meet some of the standards for that. So that's a good way to hit water quality goals, improve that. There's some road resiliency improvement, as we saw, the places where we've done some of these projects held up well during the July storm. So we'd be looking to use the existing road erosion inventory, culvert inventory, upgrade those sections. We can use it as grant match for certain grant funds. We might be able to stretch it even far, <coughs> farther. So that was one use. And then the rest of the ones, there's a little bit for economic development, electric vehicle charging stations, which are also in uh, what the committee got for projects. Um, and then different technology-based upgrades so that if we had another pandemic or a similar event, we'd still be able to function. So that's everything from um, you know, revamping the website to um, looking into permanent and licensure software that we could sort of add on to that so that if for some reason the offices were closed, you'd be able to do everything from pay your water <coughs> bill to apply for a zoning permit to you, know, you name it, you'd be able to do it right from that one portal. And we priced some of those pieces out and identified some vendors. Um, and that fits that resiliency and sustainability. And we put a little bit to see if maybe we can do some meeting room technology upgrades. Um, this is a new owl. It does look like the picture is a little clearer than the last iteration of it. We still have the old one for upstairs or other use. Um, but this is sort of how to mitigate some of the sound issues, make sure there's access, that there's, you know, it's pretty easy so that if we have to go remote and or semi-remote, people can still participate in that. So it's those types of projects that are in there. And then a community grant program, that's others, something others are trying. I talked about mechanical things. That'd be one where we have to set parameters, criteria, application before we were able to send money out the door. But we've seen communities around the nation sort of form those as a way to get those dollars out into the community for sort of broader project type purposes. And then just in looking back to the list that the committee got, some of these downtown pedestrian improvements was the one right after Orange County Parent Child Center. There are some of these pieces are in work. I mean, as you see with the board grant, some of these things have already shot off and found other funding sources or on different paths um, or have you know, different avenues available to them. Stroll to Randolph Senior Center on a sidewalk was one of them. Well, that's in a scoping study that you just approved a grant for through a VTrans program. So that process is in motion mm -hmm. on sort of a separate track, mm -hmm. but parallel to all of this. Um, mm -hmm. Community park at Smokestack area, as Maria had mentioned, we just did that through the Borat grant. So some of these things may take different forms as we go through that. But we can pull those pieces, you know, parts piece, and identify some of these things. And the elevator keeps turning on and off, and every time it does it. 
That's what I can hear in my head rather than the words I'm trying to give to you. <laughs> um, so just kind of, this is a refresher, this is a review. One of the things to think about, we can formalize this, is whether or not you want some kind of obligation process. So much like the committee did, spent a lot of time developing a matrix to take those projects that it got and figure out how to prioritize and rank them. Do you want to go that formal? Do you want something else? So just start thinking about, do you want something that you can feed everything to and, and turn, you know, turn it through the grist mill and come out with that? You know, how do you want to evaluate these so that there's some process for the decision making? Mm -hmm. okay. We can give you some ideas based on what others have done, what we've even done before, um, so that future meetings can put you on that direction, give you something to look at. But that would be kind of one of the other pieces. And then setting a rough timeline for obligation. Um, it'd be nice to be on the earlier end rather than the later end and scrambling to meet that 2024 deadline, but responding to slightly chaotic moments is becoming a specialty of ours, so. Do we have any questions on the projects already identified? Because we have two parties here asking to be added to the list that didn't go through the process of the committee. I don't think I have any other questions. I did have a couple of just like maybe just one comment about mm -hmm. our priorities in terms of how we spend this money. And to me, well, we have the, the FEMA match, which seems important for obvious reasons. You know, we have to raise that money somehow, somehow, no matter what. Mm -hmm. It's not an option. And so it's just kind of nice timing that we don't have to go out and borrow that money <clears throat> to um, to do these repairs. But in terms of most of the other projects, it seems to me that um, the best use of this money in many cases is going to be to either be using it as seed money to pull in other money, right, where we're, where we're, we're using it to, mm -hmm. as, the, as the match mm -hmm. and, and leverage it to get other money, especially for, for projects that like, we might not be able to do otherwise. Um, and the other sort of bucket is um, money that will be sort of like a a real investment of some sort where we can, even if we can't calculate it, we're like pretty sure we're going to see some sort of a good return on the investment. Not just kind of the kind of thing that would be like, well, this would be kind of nice to have, like, wouldn't that be great? But more like, well, if we do no, do this, we know it's going to have these kinds of effects, and it's going to bring us economic value in some, in some you know, significant way. And one of the ones that, that occurs to me that sort of fits into that category would be like, and we've already started doing some of this, is like website development, where it seems like it's a really obvious need. We haven't been really been able to prioritize it high enough on our list to, with the money we've had, but it really seems like one of those things that is going to have a real economic return to us over time. It's going to be really hard to measure what that return is, but it seems like so. Anyway, so I'm thinking those are the kinds of things to really make best use of this money so that we feel the effects of this money over you know, a really long period. Well, the positive of the website, though, is it does it meets the other goals of the money. Yeah. It, so it, it, we have another pandemic, and nobody can come in the town yeah, offices yeah. No, for that, a year. That, Everything can still run. It makes it even better. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Agreed. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and it, I think it adds. Uh, depending how you do it, it you see the benefit not only in that area of resiliency, but you see it in day-to-day -day operations. Right. Yeah. So we're struggling right now with staff hours, and so anything we can do right. like that that improves that, I think, is mm -hmm. your spot on. Yeah. 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 yeah, if it means that we don't have to hire a certain amount of hours in-house, then we're saving money every year because we're not spending as much money on staff time for certain things. Yep. That's a real investment. It pays, pays us back money. Agreed. We hope yeah. to further harmonize some of the different things, too. So I mentioned the licensing and permitting software, and we can possibly use that for dog licenses, for example. And there's a process to verify vaccinations and stuff before we mail tags, for example. But that's been a common use of this and other platforms. And we've talked to some of those municipalities that have used it for that. And then if we can integrate it with some of the recreation-based stuff, you truly could from your pandemic bunker. I don't know what program you're going to register for, probably something that's provided online, of course, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, but you could do it all there, one payment, one payment module, make it a little bit easier to use that payment module for 
everything and anything. And basically join the modern era where most of, almost, I mean, think how many people in the room use this for day-to-day -day commerce, basically? I mean, pay bills, you set them up. Yeah. But that's part of it, right? Yeah. Like, it isn't even sure. pandemic related. Like, you want to sign your kid up for a sports event or something, it's so much easier just to then have to come here and track down somebody and hand them a check and, you know, so I think, I think that's right on. And I also agree that some, we ought to be focusing on what's going to put us in a good position to use it to leverage. And if that means doing some preliminary engineering studies or getting things ready so that when grant funds come out, that launches us into it. We've got some pretty big items coming that we're not ready for. And, you know, the money's out there. We're just not in a position to apply for it yet. Right. It would definitely put a set us up. All right, we have two folks that wanted to add to it. So this is your opportunity to talk about so your. I don't hear very well. So do you have a microphone that you can speak into? What, what would you like me to? Just, I, it's your chance to tell us what your project okay. is and what you think okay, the great. select board ought to do to All right, yeah, put you on the list. So I um, am the president of Little Sunshine Child Care Center. We're um, hoping to open an 18, um, a child care center for infants and toddlers, uh, 18 total, in uh, Bethany House on Main Street in Randolph. So we're conveniently located to downtown Randolph and the businesses. And I know that we missed the deadline for um, applying, and I know that you funded another child care center, but I also know that there's a huge demand for child care, and so I'm just here to uh, get on the public record that we are going to be opening a child care center, hopefully by August 1st, and um, we have uh, two large grants. We've uh, been awarded one already. Um, and we're waiting. We should hear within the next few days of our second one. And if we get the second one, we're, we are short $51,000 um, to do, like, we have to have an alarm system and some plumbing upgrades. And so we're trying to piecemeal together 51000 So I'm coming before the board just to say that we would be um, happy if we could receive some uh, funds um, and... Do you have any questions about our <laughs> Child care is pretty straightforward. <laughs> no questions? Good. No, so. I'm sorry if I missed it. I, your name and then what was the oh, yeah. dollar amount? I didn't Oh, yep. Catch My name's uh, Nancy Hutchinson. Okay. Um, and we are um, short $51,000. Um, the two grants that we applied for, the uh, construction work isn't covered. So we have to find another funding source. For the construction part so our grants cover you know some um, salaries and rent and all the equipment that we need and um, supplies and stuff but the which really doesn't make sense but anyhow <laughs> <laughs> thank you okay and the second one is yours yes uh, my name is erica hoffman case and um, i'm the executive director of green mountain economic development corporation and this isn't so much a, a it's a new iteration of a project that's on your list for innovation and entrepreneurship programming. Uh, just to share a little bit, as an RDC, we act as a facilitator to support the economic development priorities of the 30 municipalities that we serve. And previously I've been here for the number one project, Orange County Parent Child Center Randolph um, for childcare, and we're also working with Little Sunshine on their efforts. Um, on that project, we, GMEC, are acting as the real estate developer. Uh, tonight, I'm actually here as a representative of Cultivator, supporting the proposal for renovation funds. Uh, this is a manifestation of a three-year partnership with the town of Randolph, and this is to introduce innovation and entrepreneurship programming to the region. The proposal you're considering tonight is an update of the earlier project request that was submitted. Uh, in this instance, GMEDC is acting as a fiscal agent to stand up Cultivator, and this will, the Cultivator itself acting as a hub for the programming. Um, we are funding two positions, our program manager position, Abby Solomon, and strategic advisor, Matthew Johnson. Um, and this project really speaks directly to what um, Mr. Sakowitz was speaking of in terms of investment for long-term impact. 
Uh, as an RDC for this region, I have spent a lot of time with the Randolph Economic Development Committee when it was meeting. And during that time, the group was constantly seeking to support both existing and new businesses in Randolph. And the renovation that we're proposing of the Merchants Row site meets both those objectives. Uh, the space is currently vacant. It's downtown on a portion of the streetscape that has seen some, some activation, but this is kind of a blank spot on that road, that street. And it's also owned by an existing business owner adjacent to the space who would like to activate it, but hasn't really found the right match for um, funding to do so. So by utilizing ARPA funds to activate the space for the cultivator's home base as we initiate the programming, the intention is this is phase one, phase two would see a, a much broader, larger facility that would be its home base. Um, perhaps maybe next to the park over at Branchwood, that would be lovely. Um, it also lowers the barriers to entry for any other existing businesses that may be interested in coming to downtown but don't have uh, the funding available to them to outfit the space to meet their needs. Um, the renovation will provide a kind of a blank canvas with restrooms, kitchen facilities, and an open space that would be available not only for cultivator programming and the entrepreneurship and innovation spaces, but community-based functions. Uh, the tagline for Cultivator is where community collaborates, and uh, that's very much in line with what we intend to do with the space. Uh, anything to add from my colleagues? Questions? And how much are you asking for? 80,000. Okay. The biggest portion of that would be windows, which would really improve the street visual for that portion of the street as well. Okay. Any questions on that project? No? Okay. So this is space that GMEDC will find. I may have missed this. Who owns the space? The landlord of the adjacent business. So the cultivator will be a tenant. Yes. So the ARPA funds will go to upgrade the landlord's windows. In preparation for activation, not only for cultivator, but for other um, for-profit or non-profit businesses. Thank you. I would just add that the landlord has had other interested entities <clears throat> look at the space, uh, but ultimately not be able to afford the renovation to activate the space. So part of this plan utilizes an already well funded from a grant perspective around startup, the cultivator <clears throat> initiative to activate that space so that when the cultivator is maturing and can move to a, another space, that upfront cost is no longer there and new businesses can move in behind the cultivator afterwards. And you also mentioned Match um, to look at the numbers a little bit more. Uh, what it, the other funding that's coming into Cultivator is about half a million in grant funding from the Economic Development Administration through a Build to Scale grant partnership we have with Black River Innovation Campus. But that's not money being invested in that same building. No, it, there's no renovation or construction costs. It's the human capital okay. <laughs> and programming, which we already have a, a scheduled program starting up in January. Okay, any other questions on that? All right, thank I, you. I had a, I don't know, I have a just general question about ARPA. Can I ask it? You have a project you want to add to no, the list? No, no, Or discuss how they're going to be, so we're talking about the projects that are being put before the board ARPA, to yes. consider. Yes, I just had a follow-up question about the general thing. I, uh, can I ask it? Mm -hmm. um, Morgan I Easton, um, I, uh, work as a recreation coordinator, but prior to that I did submit three proposed projects. Um, I never really heard anything specifically follow up from that. Um, so also from what was mentioned earlier that a lot of folks have started to move forward on these projects in um, looking for other funding sources. So I was wondering if there was any potential for two, two things to happen. One would be 
a revisit of this list to see what is currently relevant of a project that still needs to be considered or not and also is there a consideration of just a lot of crossover and redundancies was there any um, process or going to be a process to consolidate these into department specific relevancies for the town and review those with the with the relevant departments no, I think what you heard, so tonight's just about introducing the list to the board yeah. and get, having the board go and think about what they think the process ought to be going forward. So there is no process yet. There is no, but you're, there will be an update. Okay. I can't imagine we're just going to award the money and somebody's already gone and got it. And no, that's There'll fine. be some level of communication with the folks that applied that we decide, you know, I don't know what the process will be. Okay. That's what the board has to decide. Okay. So tonight was just about here's the list of everything that came in through the committee. Here's the list of what's coming in through the town. We had a couple folks reach out to say, hey, can we yeah. pitch ours to be added to the list? That's all tonight is about. Yeah. And totally then we'll go I just know it's been come back at the next meeting and talk about what yeah. what should the selection process look like and how do we get to yeah. a decision point. Just the only point yep. I'm trying to make is that I did put in these applications a year ago and I have not heard anything as follow-up, so that's why I think a lot of these projects have just moved forward in other directions, just to make a okay. comment about that. Great. Maria? No, I think you're right on. Okay. I'm Maria Puglisi, and uh, I'm a member of the ARPA uh, committee, and or was. And I think Larry just said it very well in that we have to uh, keep in mind what, what the goal of the ARPA money was. And uh, Trevor was mentioning some things that we need money for, but I'm not sure they're appropriate for ARPA use. And so uh, I think we, and I think it would be really wise to uh, at least give some notice to the people that applied that they their projects are being looked at or something because we as a committee we we gave that information to you guys to kind of take it take it and I'd be happy to help if you guys uh, are interested in getting any of my input from what went on in the committee meetings or what we were look, really looking at with the numbers and and how we felt about each of the projects because there was, there are different ideas that were in there that you uh, probably are not aware of. Trevor maybe aware of some of them, but he, at the, at the very end, he wasn't th at those meetings, so he probably doesn't know. But <clears throat> a lot has changed in the year since these were open for application. So just yes, okay. Okay. And there are a lot of different priorities being juggled throughout that year as well. So we've had to prioritize and triage based on what was most relevant at the time, with the idea being that some things would be picked up and run through a process later on and updates would be needed. So nothing was ever just left. But we have to make choices based on footprint to get things done and get them done in the order they need to be done. And that was the decision-making matrix that was used. And we'll, part of the process will be kind of what how do we get that debrief of what you guys went through, what you talked about, what the priorities were, kind of how did you get to the decisions you made? I'd be happy to help with that if you, you want to make to be. Okay. There were just, you know, four of us, I think, at the end that were okay. you know, uh, busy doing stuff, so. Thank you right. for your continued consideration of these projects. Yep. Um, any other questions on this list? <clears throat> no? None? Okay. East Valley Community Group Building Funding Proposal Continued. Trevor, are you able to pull up that presentation that I sent in? Uh, I think I have it. I've got paper copies of it, folks, right. too. John, <laughs> sure. I'll take one. Take one down, pass it around as the song goes. This is different. Yeah, I think it's. Thanks for seeing me tonight. <clears throat> First off, I'd like to uh, commend the town for making the decision to move forward and try to find a grant writer to work for the town. I think it's a 
it's a wise decision and a big step forward for the town. Additionally, I left a report at your places, the uh, Tri-Community Spaces and Places Report, which was put together several years ago, uh, included quite a, quite a few town uh, mem members, including Mel Adams and Heidi Areas and <coughs> Judy Ifflin, Tony Keller, a steering committee, as well as a basically who's who of local organizations. The reason I share this with you is beyond the fact that I think it's great reading to get a pulse of, of uh, what people in the community felt was important within their towns. Um, it also prominently features the East Valley Community Group as one of the uh, civic infrastructure uh, solutions to what the people in the town desired from their community. So I'll, I'll leave that for you to re review and digest at your leisure, but um, as you go through that, I think you'll find lots of good information, um, especially about the East Valley Community Group. So thanks again for seeing us. Uh, quick agenda, we're going to talk about the benefits of the hall, of the steward hall, uh, proposed article for the hall refurbishment plan, and uh, a little history as well. So the East Valley Community, Community Group has been working with the town of Randolph, developing an approach for restoration of the community hall since 2020. We worked with the town to develop a scope of work which was used by the town to issue an RFP for architectural services. The outputs from that architectural services contract led <clears throat> to several levels of pricing for the fault hall restoration. Um, these ran from basic needs to options that included expansion of the services that a restored hall could provide. Um, Continued restoration and enhancement of the hall would be a focus of a restarted capital campaign by the East Valley Community Group, which to date has raised $48,000 towards the refurbishment of the hall. Today we'll be presenting a request for an article to be placed to the voters in the upcoming town 2024 ballot, which provides funding for the restoration of the hall. To cover, again, some of the benefits of the hall, um, it could be turned from what is basically an empty hulk, draining some monies from the town, to uh, one that generates income for the town, and which will cover its operating expense once restored. It could act as a fundraising site for the hall restor restoration, town committees and local groups, training and meeting site for the volunteer fire department, a restored hall is indicative of a vibrant and vital community. A rise, uh, uh, a rise in local property taxes when the hall is restored would no doubt occur. Cultural and educational activities for all ages could be held there. Disaster relief staging ground, storage, meal preparation, and shelter for North, South, and East Randolph, where presently there are no uh, facilities for that. Community meeting room for local clubs and a location for Randolph Select Board meetings and advisory committee meet, meet meetings when you want to have a meeting outside of this hall. The proposed article for the hall restoration, restoration plan is as follows. I'll read it to you. Shall the town voters authorize the sum of up to $890,000 to be borrowed by the town for the restoration of the foundation and structural stabilization of the East Valley Community Hall. Annual payments for the project will be included in subsequent annual budgets until the payment schedule has been fulfilled. This request is inclusive of a 10% contingency fund, contractor overhead and profits, and general conditions costs, which include project management. So this, this would cover the work to get the hall to a point where the structure is restored and further work can then be done without additional demolition or reversing of any previous uh, restoration activity. If this is approved, and we suggest it's placed in front of the voters to make a decision, um, the East Valley Community Group would restart its capital campaign, which has been on hold, to pursue funding to go alongside of the funding provided by the town. 
and would continue that activity into the future to fund future restoration and improvements in the hall. A commitment by the hall, excuse me, by the town would greatly enhance the ability of our group to raise money in its capital campaign, including other funding activities such as a GoFundMe and others. So the question we pose to the select board this evening is, will the select board place an article to the voters in the upcoming 2024 ballot for this restoration? I'm not sure we can answer that tonight. So I don't know that we can tell you that. I think we got to look at, we've talked about this before, about the town's bonding capacity. Mm -hmm. So we have statutory requirements of debt that we can get into. And I thought or when we looked at that, we were a couple of years out before we would ever get to the point where we can bond more. But Is there any other possibility um, of some other approach that could be taken? that working with our fundraising capacity, which we've proven we can do um, collaboratively, that would allow us to continue to move forward. Here's, here's where we are today. We've, we as a group have been working on this for four years, over four years. Um, we've raised Betsy, money. Betsy, can we have the conversation stop, please? We've, we've, we've raised money. Um, but we're reaching a point where without some kind of a commitment from the hall, it's impossible for us to go out and ask people to contribute money to the restoration of a hall. That may never occur. Mm -hmm. we, have to, we have to get beyond that hurdle if we're going to effectively raise money, which we think we can do. And I think we've proven we can do because we haven't really gone public with our campaign yet. Yet, yet we've raised $48,000. So we're, we're, we're asking for a way forward with the town at this point because if if, so, if 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 we can't map out a way forward then i'm not sure this space left for for us to be involved with this project so um trevor correct me if i'm wrong mm -hmm. debt um debt is any type of debt that the town gets into so it can be bonding it can be our bond anticipation note it's our debt on equipment and on vehicles it's that whole total value of indebtedness no matter how you get into it that counts as your debt to it's not debt to income ratio but whatever it's called but debt it's that type of thing yeah. it's a we're limited on what that number can be mm -hmm and all those operational pieces and the long-term debt all counts as one of in when we get to that value so if we're if we're talking about um bonding or if we're talking about a loan or we're talking about anything that has a repayment requirement that's in that number yeah when you think i think of debt, yeah, debt to expenditure ratio is the number we're looking at and it's basically 15% is sort of that high end of a best practices number. So 5 to 15% is your general range. Depends on your local ap appetite, borrowing capacity, all of those things. Basically, you go north of that number, that means you're putting more of your operating funds into paying back debt service. And you're south of that number, you've got more from operating and you preserve capacity to go and get future debts for the big projects that you need. It frees up that capacity or make sure it's available when you get it. And then it ties into some of the statutory mm -hmm. provisions about how much can you borrow related to your grant? That ties back to grant list. Grant list. Yeah. So there's a couple of different layers in there. When we consider debt of any kind, we've got to be thinking about all of those things to make sure that we're healthy in the moment and down the road. And we've talked through budgets for years about trying to get that debt to expenditure ratio down to get some of the debt off the books so that what we've reserved is capacity for the things that we really need, we really want that. You know, can we go to pay-as-you-go approaches more often for vehicles, big equipment, those types of things? Um, so 20, 27, 28 is the year when, if nothing else comes <coughs> on, we start to see that part open up. That open up. Which, when you think, think of where debt service is and where it's before, going, like where that window starts to open, and it's the, I think it's the Chelsea Road and that bond that that is the one that needs to come up. But that debt piece even takes in, like if you lease your copier, that lease payment counts as that, into that ratio. Like it gets pretty detailed what they look at for that. And but let's I'm not, not lease sure. any copiers. 
Yeah. It's, it's unfortunately it's yeah, the better way to I, go, to tell you the I, truth. I, but I, and I, I would I would add that you know there's there's a lot of projects out there which people would really like to see happen that were that require this kinds of these kinds of expenditures. And, and if we go back a few years, um, when um, when we got a new finance manager. One of the first things he did after looking at our books was say, "We have this. We had. We were just about to um, begin the process of borrowing money to to redo Maple Street." And Cliff came in and he said, "No way. We can't afford it. We don't have the capacity to pay back any additional debt. We're already past where we need to be." And so we stopped that project before it got started, to the great disappointment of every single person living along that street. <laughs> and that's a critical infrastructure project that will need to be done as soon as we, we have the capacity for it. So what so is our capacity today? So, um, Zero. so, so, so it's, it's, it's not great. That's, that's, I think, our point is there's, there's a lot of essential items that are going to happen before we can go out and bond a million dollars for the East, East Valley Community Hall. This, this is bonding. just the situation that we're in. But bonding isn't the only way. What other way can we do without we taking on the down? money that you, Larry, very, very, very well spoken earlier this evening? Everything that you said dives right into this project as how you still have some of the ARPA money being used. We've had, if the town can do a portion of that 800,000, we've got a lot more advantages to getting grants to help fill the rest of it. We don't have any way of getting grants right now because it's not a project. Um, the other thing is John did take time to check with Redloaf to see how our numbers were in relation to two years ago, Yeah, this, almost two years ago. This is the updated number. And these are the updated numbers. And they are including, it's as if Redloaf were to do the project, which included all the management stuff, that we don't know that we have to do quite as much as that if someone else is managing. So this project is on the ARPA list. We saw that tonight. Right. And so once we get the process sorted out, it'll be considered with the other projects. I mean, we can't give you a decision on that either tonight. It is another revenue source that's out right. there right. for some of these projects. But if you saw the list, there's oh, I a know. fair amount of competition there, too. It's the, the nature of the beast, unfortunately. And the congressional grant that we went for, that we were going, we were getting almost all that amount. and. It came up between that and the water sis water systems mm -hmm. in Randolph. Yep. And so you chose to do the water systems, which I understand. That's been a problem for 40 years. I can heard about it at supper at my house 40 years ago. So. Yep. So what's the path forward for us? Is there a path forward? It's a fair question, I think. Can it go to the town as just a a special article of what that it wouldn't be bonded that it's raised by tax money can it go that way to the town so a one year request for a nine hundred thousand dollar increase or well, part of that spread it out over well now you're in indebtedness now you got debt so you got you got to pick one or the other I don't if, know what you're if you go for nine hundred thousand and you want the town to raise a hundred thousand dollars a year, we're then committed for the next eight years at a hundred thousand dollars. It's like a loan. It's um, a indebtedness. It counts um, on it'd that. Be like that. So it's either a one hundred times hit of nine hundred thousand, which is never gonna fly. Or four hundred and fifty. That's not gonna fly either. <laughs> well, how do you one year increase how do you know? tell you. no guarantee? How do you know without trying? It's just I mean, you can try, but I'm going to tell you right now, it won't fly. Yeah, I, yeah. I think you're going to find yourselves very disappointed if you go that route, um, even at 450, even at 250, even at. We one. are at times right now where over half of the people had trouble paying their tax bills, and you're talking about you have. Um, yeah. Articles from the state coming out talking about potentially an 18 to 20 percent increase for school budgets. 
not, like, this is not going to, I don't see people saying, yeah, tax me for another 450000 for this project. I and don't I did, see it. Yeah, and I did look into the separating of the tent, of the hall from the fire station a little bit more to get some of that history. And what happened when the fire station was built, it was built as a garage. So all of the codes that were needed for a garage was what they had to do. Everything else that they needed was in the hall. So if they were to divorce from the hall, the station would have to put an addition on, which also involves a whole lot of new codes. Uh, power, water, uh, septics there, uh, showers, bathrooms. But we don't have to meet okay. all those codes if we separate that. It's uh, an existing yeah, structure. You do. I couldn't hear yeah. you, Trini. I'm sorry. What did you say? It's not, but it's not, it depends how you do it. If you did it as a standalone primary station, your codes have to meet that. If you do it at a, as a ancillary, it doesn't have to meet that. So, let, 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 let me but, just finish this. So, yeah, okay. we're looking for clarity. That's all we're looking for tonight. If you're saying there's no path forward for this group to continue with trying to restore this town building, then I'd like to hear that said, mm -hmm. because we don't I want to waste our time yeah, anymore. I, I hear you. Is, I, I, is restoration the only option the group is willing to consider versus still thinking about options of how to create and make a community space um, at the location, it, it's just restoration and preservation of historical buildings is a more expensive way um, to do building. We so, know. Now we'll consider with yeah, our community if, efforts and everything, if, but if, we can't use the building. Right. If this path is not open to us to restore the building, then the community has to be open to other ideas. But what we need to know is, is this path open or closed to us? It's a, it's a simple question. And we, we individually, we've spent hundreds of hours on this. And I don't want to spend another hour on it if I'm so not going forward. Is, is the path restoration of the existing building, or is the path creation of a community center? Because they're two different things. Not at in my mind. Right now, what that second thing you're talking about right. would go, would be on the table if this other path is closed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when because you if you put this on the ballot, whether you put it on the ballot four fifty or nine hundred or eight ninety or whatever figure it is, um, you're going to get pushback from people that are going to say, "Could we create a community center at that location?" that isn't in the restored building, but is in. So the restored building, I'm, this is hypothetical, I'm just putting this I know. Yeah. There's no land. The restored building goes away. It gets destroyed. It gets destroyed. Yeah. And we construct a new building on this site. I'm not, you know, I, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a contractor, I, I, but I think you could probably achieve more of what you're looking for, for less than $890,000 that would see the building go away and something go in its place. I'm just putting that out there. And I think a reasonable townsperson, a reasonable taxpayer is going to ask that question of you mm -hmm. if we were to put this forward. What That's a board mean? decision. Hmm? That's a board decision, right? The ultimate decision whether to destroy it and put a new building up, yes, mm -hmm. the town would have yeah. to make the decision to allow the building to be destroyed and the new building to go up. But and we have to make that in the context of every other challenge that we're facing right now in terms of infrastructure needs like the building of the new reservoir that we're involved. I mean, I mean there's this whole litany of things that understood. That's that's that's, that's understood. Those those things never 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 go away. It's, no. it's understood. So so what I'm hearing is the path is closed to the restoration from the select board's perspective for this building, and that we should, if we intend to come back to the select board, come with other alternatives. 
that no, I think what you're sense. hearing is if it means indebtedness of any type for the town right now, we can't do it. We're maxed out in our debt. I think it's in, I think Trevor's right, it's till like 2028. Like so, so we have a long term before okay. we can take on any major debt. And I don't know that any sizable, mm -hmm. you know, tax increase or whatever isn't going to fly either. There's a lot of stuff coming in this next fold. Have you thought at all about, um, for lack of a better word, privatizing the ownership of the building? No, no. we haven't considered it. In other words, suppose the town chose to sell the building to an interested investor and then put it on the market. <laughs> yeah, if that's what you want to do, put it on the market. Well, I'm just putting it out there as a hypothetical. I'm not saying that's yeah. what we want to do. No, we, I'm we just suggesting really, that. Yeah. We haven't really considered that. No. So, you, you know, oh, yeah, any I, other I, questions? Um, a couple things. I'm not sure that, that you can demolish the building plus erect an, mm -hmm. another entire new building on top of the old site and do it for a whole lot less money than it would cost you to renovate what you've got. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm concerned about that. The other thing is, you know, if, if, if we have to wait, I'm, I'm hearing we have to wait another five years perhaps to be in the running for um, getting some support from the town to, to, re uh, to refurbish the building. Um, what's going to happen to the building in the meantime? I mean, it's sitting there deteriorating as we as we speak. Mm -hmm. Sounds like there's a lot of conclusions being jumped to beyond. This conversation's come a little further than the original. And I think they're fair conclusions. Time. This mm -hmm. this this is not a one night conversation. This is a conversation that's been going on for five years. Yes, I've heard some of it in the past. So uh, okay, okay. Quote well, Morgan. Um, the 890 number that's out there, though, is only for foundation and stabilization. Mm -hmm. right. So your total is much higher than that. So you're... No, it's ADA too. Yeah, but ADA you're defines. still, then you have more on top of that. Right. So I, I think it is fair to say that you could look at other options on that site and be under that number. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty high number. Mm -hmm. um, and I get it, like when you're doing historic stuff and when you're dealing with like a stone foundation and when you're dealing with some of the repairs that have been done there and the windows and all those pieces, it racks up quick. I, I, just like I do think it's, a, it's an interesting concept to say, is that it? But I think we're still in the same boat. Like, we can't go into debt mm -hmm. for this. Like, it's a tough spot. And I, I think, uh, Tom, you asked before, uh, is it a, you know, is it a community center we seek or is it historic preservation? And you also, Alyssa, brought that up a bit. And I think, uh, I think I can speak for the East Valley Community Group and say we are a community building organization. That is, we aim to, to increase resilience and the economic viability of the East Valley in what we're doing. And so our primary goal is community rather than historic preservation. Mm -hmm. So we're not trying to, uh, to retain a, 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 an old building for the sake of its looks and character, despite the fact that it has very positive it, looks it, and it character. It definitely has them, so um, no question about it. And the, the, uh, I think you'll remember back in 2018, there was a, uh, there was a, a whole group of citizens that came together to, uh, and they called themselves the Tri-Town Places and Spaces mm -hmm. Group, right? That's and so important. Totally that was, yeah. yeah. And, um, and there, so that was, of course, that had a regional focus. People were trying to, again, address some of the uh, ills that have happened in Randolph over the course of the years of, of societal factors beyond our general control that have resulted in uh, difficulties in families and in the economy and so on and so forth. And, and our group came together in order to say, 
we, one thing that we know from our experience, common sense, and reading is that we need to create venues where people can encounter each other in a safe environment, a safe non-religious environment so that everybody can feel comfortable, um, which is sort of what civic society is about. Um, so I just wanted to make clear that that's been our thrust. Mm -hmm. We're not a group of preservationists, we're a group of community right. building people. So in that context <laughs> then, uh, Josie, the, the best question to be asking you, the question to be asking yourselves is if that's the priority, is this the best way to expend whatever figure it comes out to be, $890,000? Um, or is there some way you can achieve that same goal at a much lower cost while unfortunately sacrificing what I will agree with you is a beautiful old historic structure, but it's a historic structure. It needs of a million dollars plus worth of work. And I just, uh, I don't know, I'm just asking, uh, what's a realistic way to achieve what you want to achieve mm -hmm. uh, that's also uh, economically grounded for the people of this community? And we have, we have, you know, in, in the small amount that I know about demolition and construction, which is not zero, but yeah. it's not significant, is that no, for this, and, and as we've looked at this issue, it's, this is the cheapest option that we have been able to come up with. Mm -hmm. um, demolition and reconstruction of another building, you know, maybe a metal-sided butler building <laughs> not needed in the winter, you know, yeah. might come in cheaper. But right. beyond that kind of thing, we're not, we're not looking at anything that a community can actually use. And, but we are interested, again, in the economic and social viability of the East Valley. Mm -hmm. What, you know, and to have a, and, and, and a conversation with a truly interested select board, that would be a fantastic thing. We would love to be able to have your concern and commitment enough to sustain an ongoing conversation where we can brainstorm together. Um, so, I put it. I put that to you for your consideration. I, I, I think John asked a question which hasn't been completely answered yet, and I think I'd like to express my perspective on it. First, but before that, I'd like to say that this vision of a community center in East Randolph is a beautiful thing, and it's a worthwhile thing, and I deeply wish there was an easy way to get there. I really, really do. But it is, and I and, and when, I remember we had a meeting at the East Randolph Community Center, I'm not sure how many years ago it was now. It was just two years ago? Yeah. I feel like it was yeah. longer. <laughs> no, it was just, it, it might have been less than two. It was, it was July of uh, 22. Were we just coming out of the pandemic? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, I think we expressed our concerns about the cost pretty clearly at, at that meeting that this was, an amount of money that it was really going to be really hard to see how we could possibly come up with this kind of money as, as a town. I, I thought, I, my recollection leaving that meeting was that I felt pretty clear that that was the message that, that we sent. And I think that it's, that's still valid today, that it's going to be, it's, it's really hard to see how we're going to raise millions of dollars for this, for this building in spite of the fact that it is a beautiful vision and it and would be an incredibly awesome thing to have. Given our fiscal constraints and our priorities that we know we're gonna have going into the future, I, I just don't know when we're ever gonna have the money to be able to do something like this. And the fiscal constraints that you're talking about are gonna be there whether we raise the building and build something new or renovate this one. I mean, we're, looking at a, we're still looking you're, at a long-range timeline here, if I'm understanding what you're saying. You, you can't take on anything else right now, mm -hmm. and you can't take an, on anything else until, like, 2028. We, it's worse than that. We can't take on anything big for a few more years. Yeah. And then once we can, there are other projects that, we're, that I'm telling you, we're exactly. going to be funding before we fund this one. Yeah. It would have, yeah, it would have to be something that's important to, this, to the board. It's not even just the board, Betsy. Like, we have roads right now with water and septic 
underneath them that have to be replaced. We were in the process of going forward with some of these. We have some large projects. We got two garages in this town right now that both need to be replaced. You know, we've got a lot of infrastructure that we're going to be trying to figure out how we handle that, knowing that we've got until 2028 before we can ever bond. Mm -hmm. Like, we've got some serious challenges here. And you'll have those challenges at 28. So we will. This will yes. still be that's, low on the list. No matter it will. What. That's, that's yep. so. So, so, and that's not something we're happy about. It's just the no. reality of... So thanks, 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 thanks for meeting with with with, some, with us tonight. I, I think we know the answer. The answer is no, and for good reason. Yeah. Um, it's it's just sometimes dancing around an answer does doesn't give you the clarity that mm -hmm. is needed, which is yeah. probably what occurred two years ago at the meeting yes, in, it, in in the hall. Mm -hmm. Some sometimes a, a, a mm -hmm. hard no is is what's needed. And I'm hearing a hard no tonight. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that. That is Unless there's a wonderful pot of money out there that none of us have found yet. Well, we haven't. But I'll, I'll watch for the leprechaun. Is it well insured, <laughs> by the way? <laughs> oh my yes, God. it is. <laughs> <laughs> it falls in, you know? Yeah. Yeah, we'll Thank, you. Yep. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Intermunicipal Energy Coordinator proposal continued. This is another return item from last time. Um, we got an extra handout from the one that was in the packet, so I'll send this around. This came in today as well. It's, it's like it's a description of the IREC project in the six or so towns that have had it in place for a few years now. So my understanding of this position is, for the most part, it's going to be working on either town projects or other projects that would allow for benefits from an energy perspective. So whether it's funding that's out there to um, change heat systems in town buildings or to do whatever. And I'm really concerned that we potentially put $40,000 into a group fund which with not a whole lot of ability to manage the time of that person we're just um, committing it and I think if we're looking at bringing somebody on that is going to help us with grants and whatnot we should have our own person doing this and that should be an additional duty on that job I I am feel much better about us having the person and us managing the person and us controlling the outcomes than I do about what I've heard so far about where this position would be. And I don't know about anybody else, but I have never been able to report to a committee to get my direction. And thank God you love it, <laughs> reporting to a board. But like, yeah. if, if but that's a board in one town, like a, right. a group of people from multiple towns trying to tell you what your priorities are and everybody trying to get help for the same grant funding program and whatnot, that's chaos. I just, I feel like if it's, if we're going to focus on this, then that money, that 40000 is much better spent on a person right here. Mm -hmm. And if this is, you know, we're looking at a position right now that's going to help with zoning and grant management and whatnot, I think that's where that job duty resides. could definitely include that and make that work. Could, could I respond to that? That's what I'd like to. <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm Jerry Ward, and this is going to sound a little bit like the East Randolph Community Hall thing. It's, there, we, um, I'll just remind the select board, who was some of you were not even here then, is that a couple years ago there was a proposal to do exactly what you just talked about, is have our own position who was the energy coordinator. And it was, it didn't go anywhere, um, partly because we didn't feel like it was a needed, partly because it wasn't, it was maybe too big of a financial commitment, and partly because the town manager and COVID was overwhelmed. Uh, and that's not against you, that's just the reality that I recall is that we didn't want another person that you would have to oversee. Um, okay, I'm, may, it may have been <laughs> Adolfo, sorry. Yeah, yeah. But I'm um, so. Both are reasonable viewpoints. Um, it does take some money and oversight if it's a town employee. 
I still think that would be the ideal thing. But I didn't, I got the distinct impression that Randolph was not there, and we were advised to go with the shared project model, like Two Rivers, Atacuichi, then went ahead and did it. We didn't get in on the first round. Now we have a chance to get in on the second round. And if you don't trust Two Rivers doing the oversight, then the town needs to do it themselves. So it's, you can't have it both ways. And, yeah, um, I think in fairness, Drew, a lot has changed. I and, agree. And, okay, uh, okay. And, and if you're not, like, I'm not I think the, I no, just, no, I, I agree. I just want to explain to you, like, we've gone through a lot of change here in staffing, and we've shaken duties, and we've looked at how better to use the limited positions that we have and, and where we need to beef up and where we don't need to beef up. And one of the things we've just done is look at, like, we have an economic development director, but he's also trying to manage the zoning applications. So how do you separate that out? And in looking at labor hours versus what the duties are going to be, there appears to be more time in this position um, that's going to take on zoning and grant management. And so I think working with a group um, and doing that function of this, which is also grants and, and piecing it together, gets us back to what you guys originally wanted. Okay. And back then, we didn't have, we couldn't have, we okay. couldn't have taken this I, on two I years ago. I accept that that would be a huge benefit. Um, what you would lose in that is energy expertise, unless you found the most amazing person. Well, hold that thought, <laughs> and you call me in a few weeks and let me know if we found the right candidate. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. How can you look for a candidate if they don't have the permission? The job to go has ahead. been advertised yeah. for a while. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I think I see where this is going, and I just want to point out one thing that you know, it's not um, casting aspersions, but. There's already been up to 14 other towns that have been meeting for months. Most of the meetings, John and I were not even there, trying to get to the point where they could present an actionable proposal by the end of this calendar year so it could be funded in 2025 20, budget year, which means getting proposals actionable by January 1st so towns can actually get them on the, on the warnings and get, to, mm -hmm. get into the budget. And, They've been looking at Randolph as kind of the leader, and it would be an opportunity for Randolph to show some leadership that I was feeling like somewhat proud that we were seeming to head in that direction. And I'm not going to be devastated if we pull out, but um, there's just pointing out there's going to be some repercussions in our image with some of the other towns who are counting on us. And, so, and, and that might be included with two rivers, too. So, so um, well, I, I, think, I think you're right. Three raises a good point, though, about local control over the process and ha having someone dedicated just to these issues in Randolph um, and taking on maybe other grant writing responsibilities as well. It just feels like uh, I'm willing to let the other communities be disappointed in us. If, yeah. okay. I don't think we have the capacity to, to yeah. take on the leadership role for 20 plus other communities. Oh, well, that's, that's not what yeah. No, that wouldn't be what it would be. No. We, we would be the biggest player in the pool. Right. We would not have any more leadership, really than the other towns. It would be two rivers that would be taking on the role. So that wasn't clear last month either. There was this sort of nebulous Well, no, it, role in your packet is, is, is exactly what two rivers' role would be. Uh, Peter Gregory outlined it very clearly. He, he'd be willing to be the, the one that would fire and hire and do all the evaluations and... But this is in the stuff we got today, for today's meeting, right? It wasn't in last month's. It was in the packet. It was no, in the packet you got right this after for the select board yeah. meeting. Right. Yeah. It was in response to the six questions that we left the last meeting. Yep. Right. With. Okay. And, we, and we were... And that's incorporated in this. It's but not in that document, no. no but Trevor no. has received it. Um, and it was in the packets. Uh, I read it yeah, last night. 
Yeah. Yeah, it was in the packet right before the document you're looking at, Tom. Mm -hmm. Ask a question. Um, it, it seems to me uh, with, with, so I'm trying to get a sense of the board that uh, with budget constraints being what they are um, and labor constraints that a, uh, a, one of the, as I understand it, one of the reasons to have an energy coordinator is because we need to save money on our buildings uh, and our town use of energy, that, we're, that there would be a net gain in, in that effort. It's not altruism, it's common sense. Um, B is we, uh, that sharing, if under the responsible supervisory ship, not of a, of a chaotic committee, luckily, if Two Rivers is as good as their word, and we know that organization, of course, everybody does, um, then would, why wouldn't you go for it exactly? Well, if we're going to have a position and we're going to go through energy efforts and grants, right, and we have other grants that we could apply for that we're not able to do now because we don't have the capacity, those have the ability to have some level, some are capped at 5,000, 10,000, whatever they are for managing them, but others you can get a percentage or whatever. So if we have a potential for revenues to help offset that position and the more grants they go out and get, the better that is why wouldn't we have the position here where they can focus on Randolph's goals versus a limited number of hours to do the work for us and other grants to help us not only have work in the energy field but in all these other fields that we need assistance with where we can get f revenue to help offset the position and have it benefit all the areas of the town that need the help. Is, is this in the present job description that I saw posted for a grant writer? Uh, and that's not a facetious question. I'm just yeah. It is, okay. Yep, grant writer. Yeah. No, no, the, 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 well, we, we were talking about an energy coordinator for the, from the T-Rook standpoint, but you're saying that this person is going to be covered by, this activity will be covered by this new hire. We will probably need to amend that job description to include some of this stuff, which will also match our preferred candidate. Canada. I don't want to be around the bush. We got close, but not there. So okay. this will be resolved. If everybody could exercise patience. Will <laughs> it will become clear? So, so that, that there. It, well, is there uh, in in this position uh, a uh, beyond grant writing? It seems as though uh, energy coordination uh, in the town would require some some focus on current energy use patterns um, and some history of of the of yeah. our infrastructure and how it performs not just seeking grants. So I'm wondering, is that, is that true? So Josie, I think what, I think what you gotta do is trust us that we got this one. This is the best approach to it. And once we can finish and have it official and we announce it, you'll be like, yes. But just- That'd be great. Thank you. Pause for a little bit and- May I just offer one, one more comment? Sure. Um, since this came in late today, this IREC project summary, this is essentially what, as I understand it, Jeff Grout has been doing for the other six or seven towns that have already the IREC one. And um, I found it pretty impressive to look at what the cost savings are. Admittedly, a lot of this is the low-lying low line fruit that's been plucked, and it won't be looking this good every year, but this is impressive. This is a magnificent return on investment, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a million and dollars it, over And I over think if you could years. steer this new position um, towards these kind of projects, it'll be well rewarded. And it's that. what I've been looking for with this push to get an energy coordinator for a couple of years. So. Yeah. I, no, yeah. I absolutely concur. <laughs> um, and and um, having, having that person at our disposal, answering only to us, and this gives us a real template for what they can be. Well, going but that's at. just the energy side, right? Yeah. Like, so right. now take their time. If they're doing it for multiple towns now, they're just doing Randolph and doing other types of efforts exactly. in that round too. Like exactly. that multiplies that. Sounds yep. like you have it covered. 
we'll check with you in a couple weeks. Okay. Make sure you agree. <laughs> we'll, we'll be back. <laughs> All right. Uh, Norwich Solar Technologies. That's, that's me, Jim Merriam uh, of Norwich Solar. Uh, and I will say one quick plug before that. I was also the director of Efficiency Vermont. And if you are looking for services that are free and guided, I would definitely have your future energy coordinator, which I'm sure you're already doing, work hand in glove with an energy co uh, energy consultant at Efficiency Vermont, source of rebates and tier three funds from the utilities. Um, well said. Thank you. Uh, so on to today's matter. So I'm here as the applicant for uh, Randolph Davis Solar, who received uh, a request from the Public Utilities Commission to, uh, which should be in your packet, to very specifically uh, complete the evidentiary record for the project, which is to uh, have the town select board and town planning commission um, document that they have seen a drawing in a survey that shows that we will not be installing solar panels on slopes greater than 25%. Uh, and again, the, <clears throat> the uh, order should have been in the packet. The very last end, it's a very short request. Uh, the condition it wanted satisfied was a letter from the town, RDS Exhibit 2, I believe. Um, and in it, it just basically demonstrates, we have to demonstrate to you prior to construction that we've shown you a drawing that we're not installing solar on slopes greater than 25%. So I've also provided a letter for convenience that uh, is very short and sweet that basically says that the town board boards uh, have seen the survey and uh, we have satisfied the requirements of the town original request, which was to see a survey uh, prior to installation. I didn't say that. I think it's important if you make a decision. I'll check with the folks at the PUC. We put a letter on town letterhead that meets exactly what they're after. Yeah. Well, we appreciate that help to help us. I think it's we're at the spot where we want to make sure we're locked into what we need to be locked into. Okay. And, and if I could interject, the order is not very long on that particular piece, and it's pretty short, and that's what it's looking for. Yep. So the the survey that was completed was done after everybody was questioning the slope. No, we uh, the survey document that you have is dated February February of 2022. Yep. What the evidentiary record does not have is that. In the subsequent meetings where the preferred letter was upheld, we did not document or have documentation that we completed the requirements of you saw that, that survey. So even though we relied on the fact that even though the preferred letter was held and you didn't rescind it as the course of why this was met, the PUC, because this has gone on for a long time with a lot mm -hmm. of intervention, just wants to clean up the record to make sure that that condition was met and uh, that you've seen the, the drawing or the survey with the panels not on. Yeah. Just to clarify, this is the one we're talking about. Yep. Uh, that was the one that was provided. Right. Exhibit RDS MS 2A, revised 2 9 2022. That's. And this was in the time frame when we were talking in this letter, or this, the request from the town came out. And so there's a key down in the bottom. You have this, this is in the packets for anybody. Yeah, so the yellow the area the screen is the, uh, the key the yellow indicates shaded this. Area is the slopes greater than 25%. The panels hard. are the black outlines that are hard, difficult to see there, but those work around the um, shaded area. And the, but that survey right there that advises they won't be built on the 25% slope is done by an engineer, correct? correct? Or a, a surveyor? Harati. Yes, exactly. As you scroll over to the right-hand side, you can see that it's uh, Horizons Engineering. And this is part of the evidentiary, this, this, this is part of the it's evidentiary in. record at the PUC as well. I 
it's doing that little blitzy thing, but it catches up. So the hearing order, page 32 of that, we're talking about section eight under order and it's number two. And so this is the site plan we're being asked to verify satisfies the concerns in the letter that's in your packets that Sonny wrote when he was playing commission chair mm -hmm. in December of 2021. And that letter said that slopes greater than 25% were essentially off limits for panel construction and installation. This line looks awfully close right here. These, there is clearance that can't be seen from the map. Correct. I, I think that there may be a little bit of a slight overhang there, but it's not installed in that area. Exactly. Overhang, meaning the side of a panel is headed over the slope? Maybe. I can't quite see from that one right that. Yeah. Um, there's nothing installed in that 25%. So this is the there it is. This is the spot I'm talking about, right here, where there's a couple that they, they intrude. It looks like they do based on this. Yeah. This one's tight, but doesn't look to oh, overhang. Yeah. yeah, there. Fifth or sixth one down to sort of a gray, uh, a grayish green area. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So overhang being nothing is physically or attached. Dallas. This would be post driven, and the post would not be in that area. The post would be all in the gray area. Okay. <coughs> Let's zoom back out for you. Do we know if the... Will it be time for me to make a comment on yep, this? Yep, yep. Just to let us get our head around the <coughs> site plan and what we're actually being asked to do. Um, what they said was you couldn't know, you couldn't do any construction, any earth work within that 25 slope. Yes. If I remember correctly. So those are just... There's no earthwork because the post is on the top, but then the slope has just a panel hanging out over it. Yeah, or just Correct? a piece or a corner. Okay. Okay. This is another thing that we've encountered here that I've not been asked <laughs> in 20 years, so. Thank you well, for continuing this my isn't, education. Is yeah. it normal process for them either? Um, okay. Um, so we have a comment in the back. Yeah. My name is Michael Binder, and I'd like to point out a few things. First of all, in the letter that you're asked to confirm, it's uh, in your packet, Exhibit RDS MS14. It's the letter that Sonny Holt sent to Norbert Solar Technologies stating uh, that they accepted Norbert Solar's promise that they would rearrange the panels. And of course, the Public Utilities Commission says that's not enough. You actually have to see that it was done. Um, but what it says in that letter um, is that we further, that's the Planning Commission, further request to see your final solar rate plot plan prior to construction. And that's not what's up there. There have been six uh, site plans at the PUC on this project, and that's number three out of six. Now, they're not showing you four, five, and six. And there's something uh, that I know about and the PUC knows about uh, that they don't want you to see. And that's why they're not showing you the final plan. So um, I would say at this point what you should do, um, and I'm prepared to go through and explain the evidence that the PUC has seen that this uh, panels actually are on slopes greater than 25%, and that this is a contrived slope layer uh, made from a uh, defective survey. And I have the evidence for it. We have the data from the survey, uh, the raw data, and I have an analysis of it. 
But what I would suggest at this point is that you defer this decision to the next meeting when they can show you the actual sixth site plan, the final site plan, which is what the PUC wants you to ver verify. And meanwhile, uh, the Norris Solar has to go to the Planning Commission also to get permission. In this case, the Planning Commission is not advisory to the Select Board. Each has their own separate and equal voice, and the preferred sites letters have to be unanimous among the Planning Commission, the Select Board, and the uh, Regional Planning Commission. So in any case, um, what I would suggest is that you let this go to the Planning Commission first, where perhaps their agenda wouldn't be as crowded as this agenda is tonight, and let them uh, pass judgment. And then after they do that, if they judge that uh, they want to affirm the uh, letters, it would come back to you to do the same. If they uh, do not affirm the letters, uh, you will have avoided having to deal with this at all. Because, like I said, uh, the PUC wants us to be uh, from individual, each uh, commission and board has its own voice. But in any case, uh, this is not the final site plan uh, that was submitted to the PUC. It's a third out of six. And therefore, um, it does not meet the criteria in this letter of them bringing back and showing you the final site plan. So, um, and if you want to go forward with the vote, I'd be happy to uh, try and present the evidence as best I can that the PUC has seen that shows that the panels are, in fact, still on slopes greater than 25% throughout, uh, not just a little bit of overhang there, uh, but throughout. Furthermore, to say that there's no earthwork in that yellow area is incorrect also, since they are planning to uh, develop that area uh, by stumping it, grading it, and so forth on very steep slopes. Uh, the road itself is on great 39% slopes, that has not been rebutted by Norwich Solar. In fact, their engineer has admitted it uh, in his testimony. And um, as you know, the Randolph uh, the, um, zoning here prohibits development on any natural slopes over 30%. And yet they're developing a road that does not exist now on 39% slopes. So um, that's not exactly the question you're asked to look at uh, the arrangement of the panels here. But um, that's part of what's on the other site plans that they have not shown you. So um, that would be my advice, is that you let this go to the Planning Commission, uh, and I will present evidence to them uh, showing that the panels are on greater than 25% slopes, and we'll do it with their most recent site plan rather than the third out of six. Thank you. So the third out of six was the drawing that was at the time when the letter came out and is consistent with that. Right. And um, do you see a letter at this time? Hey, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think if you read the order above the request for the order, there's a pathway for landowners adjacent to adjudicate their grievances, which the PUC has clearly pointed out is within the PUC. The request from the board here is very specific. I can provide the last version from Horizons, an independent third-party engineering firm that shows that the panels will not be installed on 25% slopes. That's easy. Um, this was the one that was consistent with the time of when the letter came out. And the PUC was looking to complete the evidentiary record. We can provide six and we can provide three. Because I feel like if we provide six, the question and the statement would be, well, this was not the one that was at the time when the letter came out from the town. We can provide both of those to you. All I'm trying to do is meet the request of the Public Utilities Commission, which has asked the applicant to come and simply show you the drawing, independent third-party survey drawing, that has not been discredited by the Public Utilities Commission if the drawing is incorrect that can be taken up with the Public Utilities Commission in the manner that they have expressed in the order it should be done. Um, I, this has been a, a long case where I feel like the normal process has been subverted, and I'm just trying to limit your time and exposure on this, and I'm trying to comply with what the Public Utilities Commission has asked us to do. Um, I think, no, oh, hang on. Um, in the order, 
if I'm reading it correctly, and this is maybe where the new board member will be helpful. Um, it gives you 90 days to file evidence demonstrating that Randolph's Planning Commission and Select Board have determined that the condition stated in that letter um, has been satisfied. And, um, and then it does say that any objection or request for a hearing to contest the evidence filed pursuant to that paragraph, the, the thing, must be filed within 14 days, which would, would mean if anybody doesn't agree with what you presented to us and what the, but um, RDMS 14 is Sonny's letter. So, um, <coughs> But Sonny's letter, it's a, it puts an interesting twist to it because what he says is um, that you'll submit the, um, the survey before it goes to construction, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that what the intent is? It's not. It says the final solar array. Stop, please. Yes. Request, request to see it. Right, yeah. before it goes to construction. So, but it's a bit, I mean, a bit what, of a circular argument there. You can't go to construction without a. Without their permit. And what, basically, what they were, not sure why the Planning Commission would have asked to see the final construction drawing that came out of the PUC. And like, I'm not sure. He did. They asked for it, which is fine, but that's just submit it to us. Like, that's a complete our file or because they have no authority after that point. So it feels like what they're asking us to do is to confirm that a condition has been met that can't be met until you have their permit. And at the time, it that's why we put this drawing in here. <clears throat> at the time, it was to show the final, depending on how you want to look at final, that was the final drawing at that point. In the at time. the time Sonny wrote his letter. Right. And what has changed? Uh, and maybe Brendan can pop on in this, but what has changed is there is a vernal pool at the top that we've moved back panels from. I don't know if you can pop on, Brendan. Uh, that's not on sure. this plan. I understand. Hello? Yeah, so can, let me just let me see if I can. Sure. To find a point on the question between three and six, what's different? Yep. So uh, in the at the very top, um, where up here, uh, right? Uh, right uh, where you're talking. Uh, yes, correct. There is a, a vernal pool that is off the parcel, but uh, a buffer from that vernal pool uh, has forced uh, a relocation of the, uh, the northernmost row of panels uh, on, the, on the kind of left of the two rows of panels. There you go. So what you would see on the next version of the drawing is a, kind of a, um, a buffer from that vernal pool and the panels outside of that buffer. Um, just thank, thank you for listening. The one thing I might say is just The condition that has to be met is the condition that, uh, at the time, Sonny, as the chair, uh, uh, wrote in his letter, and that's the that's the condition that we met by providing this site plan. So, in response to his letter, we provided this site plan with the uh, the engineered slope data. There were following site plans. Um, they were in response to other requests. So this is the site plan in response to Sonny's condition. And so the, the, uh, the request from the PUC is explicitly, was, did the applicant meet the condition that letter? And if so, did, 
did you uh, did you see the uh, information that was provided? So that's this information. That's why this version is provided. This is the version that was provided at the time to meet the condition in the letter. Mm -hmm. And but site plan six still meets the condition of the letter with Every regards to the slopes. So the subsequent drawings all show both slope data as well as uh, panels not on slopes over 25 percent correct and so um, if if for instance the technology allowed and you're able to zoom in uh, you know to a, to a very detailed level there there is not an overhang here uh, it's just a, a matter of presenting it so brendan if we if our letter back to them is very specific of um, this exact exhibit was provided to the town. This meets the intent of Sonny's. According to this exhibit and what we've seen from the survey completed by this company, there's no, there's no panels installed on the 25% grade, although some may hang over onto that area. I mean, that's right. literally and, and what I, we're I being- just, uh, I think that's correct. And I think on that technical point, even this plan does not show any overhang. Uh, if you if the zoom function was you know detailed enough, I would confirm that too. I have been able to zoom in, and it actually looks different when you. It does look different when you zoom in, Alyssa. So, Alyssa, in your experience, um, in your prior life, is this normal for them to come back to a select board and ask us to? send a letter like this? I am not familiar with it, no. I, I don't think that this is normal. I think it's a, uh, a reasonable request for uh, a, uh, an application that has now been in process for over two years and has a quite voluminous record. And so given all the back and forth, I think that this is a uh, while not normal, uh, it is a reasonable request for the Public Utilities Commission just for the clarity. Uh, the applicant uh, you know, says that this condition is met. Can the town confirm that the condition was met? Mm -hmm. and, and I think the Public See, Utilities I, Commission was explicit. They were trying to complete the evidentiary record because it has been a contentious case. I don't think they, they can allow anything to be left open. Yep. Um, but it, it feels like uh, through the PUC process, this changed some after the one that's sunny. So I, anything we were to send up to them, I'd want to be very specific about this is the site plan we're looking at. This is, you know. Well, could I make a suggestion that we can send uh, six, the last version as well, so that you can I mean, Zoom you can in, send see. it to us, but I think this is the one we're going to rely on this for a letter. This asked. is the this one. This is the one, yes. I mean, you can explicitly ask that. Um, do, you, do, you, do you anticipate that they might ask us to weigh in on 6-2? I mean, I, they I, have asked you to. No. Read they, the letter. I don't think they have. The, uh, may but I speak? I, my concern is this is the site plan we're being presented tonight yes to uh give our opinion on and we have um we have a licensed surveyor because they have to be to pr to produce these that's telling us there's no construction on a 25 percent slope according to their plan i mean that's what we have to rely on i mean i'm not a surveyor i don't feel like i can and, second and guess this them. is and this is a conversation we had previously and basically, they're just asking us, did you really have that conversation in essence? And can you just confirm that what, you, what, you're, what the applicant is telling us you said then is, is really what you said? And Correct. You, and you still, it's, it's, it's a slightly different board, right? It's not, exact, it's not the same people, right? Select, select board, yeah. Right. In so, commission. So, so we're basically reconfirming our previous decision, which said, we see that there's no panels being placed on slopes greater than 25%, so this counts as a preferred site. 
it meets the conditions of Sunday. Correct. Yes. If you sent site plan six, site plan six is the final solar array plot plan prior to construction? It's the final plan that is available right now. So yeah. until you're permitted and ready to go to construction, you can't fully satisfy, but this is as close. I'm just trying to figure out how to It just seems like it's, hit it's both of very, those. very much a PUC procedural issue. It's, they're just coming back to us to make sure that what they think we're set, we said that we really did say. Well, and I, and uh, yes, I agree with you. And I understand where the version six is coming from, but Sonny's letter doesn't request version six. It says prior to going to construction, Prior to going to construction is after the PUC gets done. May I so read what it says? Our, I got it right here. I just read right it. In front of May I read the last it's, sentence? It's the my you know my I don't want to take version six because that wasn't part of our decision making. Right. Our decision that's, that's making is off this, this version. What the PUC did with versions four, five, and six is after us. So to me. That's giving us new information and asking us to make a decision based on something new, which I'm not comfortable doing. No. Okay. May I read the letter? The we last have, right Michael, we have okay. it. The last sentence it. says, we further request to see your final solar array block prior to construction. Prior this to is not the fire final. And not only that, this is not the site plan that Sony ever saw. Sony saw the first site plan and then requested that they make changes, which resulted in the second site plan, and this is the third, and there's been a fourth, fifth, and sixth. Now, if Sony only saw the first one, and he requested that they see the final one prior to construction, you have not seen the final one prior to construction. We're not at construction, Michael. We're at the well, PUC, and the, at the PUC, four, five, and six were created, not when the town was involved. This is when the, the town, town wasn't was involved. involved with this one either. This is after the town vote. This was released in February. The, the December 2021 is when Sonny did his illegal meeting on December 14th, actually two years ago today. Okay, And yeah. the only site plan present when was the first the, one, and they the objected to it vote? because the first one showed panels on 40% slopes. Okay, whoa. When did the sl select board vote? On the first, the letter when it came up was June of 21, and then there was some action we revisited around this time. So it was in December that the planning board. commission was involved. Correct. So it had to be after December when the town when the select board was involved. The select board was involved in January and February. In both meetings. The, okay. the board is talking right now, please. Okay, I'm sorry. Trini, I feel like your idea makes sense to just make the letter clear that this is the version we saw. Well, I, I think it, it sets the parameters around what we're making our decision based on. You know, we're, right. we're responding to their request that we've got this, we've got it from a licensed surveyor, um, you know, from the information provided to us on this version, it meets the intent. If they went on, I don't know, you know, does that mean version six eventually has to come back and be given to the planning commission? I mean, yes. I, get, I guess that's probably part that's of Sonny's the, letter, but they don't have any authority. PC, that's not what the PC is asking us for. No, it isn't. They're asking us for this. 100%. Yep. Yep, and I think the letter, if the letter is specific on what plan we're looking at and what we're... I mean, it's, it, 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 is it within, you might know this better than the rest of us, but is it within the PUC's purview to say we want version 6 to go back to, to the Planning Commission for a final review? I, I don't know, but it doesn't seem like that that's what they're asking That's not for. what no, they're asking no. us. So it I mean, doesn't really matter. They're free to ask that if they want, I, would, I think. But I would right now they're so, asking, they're not, not what is this what asked. we saw in response to Sonny's request? And it seems that it is. So if, as long as we're explicit 
in that language, as Trini suggests, and as Alyssa uh, concurs, we should be fine. I think I, I think that's the best way to handle this. Like, this is not normal for them to come back and and say, "Are you sure you're sure?" <laughs> like, yeah. But well, I, I mean, I you know, putting myself in their shoes, putting yeah. our, ourselves in their shoes, as Larry suggested, they're just trying to fill the evidentiary. Well, and uh, attach this right to the letter. Send the letter up, attach this to the letter, and be like, this is the version we looked at. This is what was provided to the select board to evaluate. And, and it meets our criteria for preferred sites. Yep. I mean, if there's another version, that can be contested at their level. Great. I think my question is fine again. Yep. It has the other versions have been contested at the PUC, and the reason the PUC has sent this back is because of the overwhelming evidence that in the final plan, the panels are still on greater than 25% slopes. And I would be glad to present that evidence tonight. As far as you're saying that the PUC wants you to evaluate this, that's not correct. This was sent to you by Norris Solar Technology, and this is what they want you to uh, evaluate tonight. In reality, Sonny's, the, the PUC order wants you to confirm that the conditions in Sonny's letter have been met. The conditions in Sonny's letter were, when he wrote this letter, they'd only seen the original plan, and he said, we want to see the final plan that you finally have that gets approved by the PUC before you start construction, and that is not what they've shown you tonight. Okay? They've shown you number three, and the commission has sent them back to you to find out if the conditions in this letter are, you know, have been fulfilled. What it says in this letter, first of all, is that the slope, the panels are on uh, less than 25% slopes, and I can demonstrate they are not. And then it also says that you are supposed to uh, evaluate that on the final site plan. Sonny wants the si final site plan that comes through the PUC to come back here uh, and be evaluated, because that's where you're going to get to see the evidence that these panels are not on uh, less than 25% slopes. So um, if, if you want to make some sort of statement that, well, this is what we saw then and we, that's all we still see now, I don't think that's going to satisfy the Public Utilities Commission. They're sending this back because they know that the panels are on greater than 25% slopes, and that's why they're sending it back. Are you sure? You haven't seen everything. You only saw you know, these, these early drafts. These well, early, uh, we can be really so, uh, is it possible that I could say a few words? What, one this moment, Brent. Right. Brendan, one moment. Okay. I, no I think we can just be very specific in, in our letter, right? Mm -hmm. We can say, according to the survey, that we have seen the survey, which clearly indicates... Well, we can that, note what it is. That the, ...that the slopes are less than 25% and that we've seen the survey. And the survey data conforms with our idea of what the preferred sites are. And if the survey data is, is wrong, if, there, if they did something wrong, then that's a whole other issue. We're not affirming whether the survey is done properly or not. All we would be affirming is that we have seen the survey and that the survey that we have seen indicates that this parcel conforms with our preferred sites. But, and I think we can not only mention what it is, we can attach it to it. Like if the PUC sure. wanted us to say, if, if the PUC said to us, evaluate version six, they should have included it, right? Like that's after it left us. Right. And they don't say to us, we don't think they're being accurate, that there's no way this is on 25%. That appears to me something they would have questioned of them uh, during uh, the if, process. If I could speak, uh, a licensed surveyor falsifying information for the point of yeah. us getting a preferred site letter would shut good. that business down. And that would be of paramount importance to the Public Utilities Commission and professional boards. I can't imagine you paid them enough to shut their business down, but... <laughs> well, <laughs> My so, preference on this is to just write that letter and be very specific. So, I have a question on Mike. You're contending that this request is coming through 
No, with solar and not directly from the PUC. Absolutely. The order from the PUC asks them to come back to you and see if the conditions in this letter that Sonny Holt wrote have been satisfied. Okay. okay. The hearing order says condition. Yeah. Get into one condition. It says condition. The one condition of a of a site plan that shows not no construction on a 25 percent slope is the, what exactly we're being asked right. to confirm. Okay. Sorry to jump in front of you. No. And I, I, I think we've we've really laid to rest this idea that we need to see the final construction. Like that's really not what we can do because, like not, you said before, it's like, not there yet. It's sort of a chicken or the egg kind of thing. We can't do one that, re that requires the other and go back in time. So we just, the condition, it seems really clear to me that, that the intent is that the condition is slopes greater than 25%. We're not going to be putting solar panels on those steep slopes. Mm -hmm. May I present the evidence that the PUC has seen that shows that these panels are on greater than 25% slopes? I don't that's think we, our, that's not our, our ours. Like, that's their purview. I mean, now you're going to, we would need the other, the surveyor here to counter what's being said. And are you a surveyor? Oh, I worked as a surveyor. I'm not licensed. Yeah. So, I mean, now you're on an expert versus expert. That's the PUC. I was judged job. by the PUC expert on this thing, and that's why they accepted my uh, yeah, and that, data right. that showing that this is wrong. Oh. And that's why they come back to you, because they know that you put a condition that these pounds must be on less than 25 percent slopes, and they don't want to give a CPG out and find out afterwards that the conditions were not met. That's why they want you to look at the final plan and see where those panels are. The panels aren't even arranged in the final plan, as you see there, because like you said, they found two wetlands that they overlooked the first time and had to rearrange the panels again. But we're not, we're not judging the final plan. We're judging this plan. And this is the plan we're going to attach to our letter. And this is the plan we're going to tell them that we looked yes. at this, and this is the one that did it, and that they used a licensed surveyor. I am not able to tell whether you or their surveyor are the right party. I, you want to talk railroads and airports and farming? I can do it with you all day long, but I am not a surveyor. And I don't know if any of us have the technical skills to say you're right or they're right. Well, what we have to rely on is this is a licensed surveyor that stamped this plan. And it's his. If it's wrong, then you should take it up with the folks that. First of all, that's not a licensed surveyor plan. Okay, a uh, surveyor you know, plan would look a lot different than that. This is a site plan for construction at the PUC. And secondly, uh, that yellow stuff you see on there is on the succeeding plans also, along with other data that shows that uh, the panels are not uh, correctly situated. Uh, I think. If you read the, what the commission has asked, they've told Norbert Solar to go back to the town and see if the conditions in Sonny's letter have been met, the conditions, the conditions. But the condition is, first of all, that the panels be not on 25% slopes or greater, and that, that the Norbert Solar come back to the town with their final plan so that they can see it. And this is not the final plan. And it says final plan. But right that's a different stuff. condition, Michael. We're going to disagree on that one. That We won't have that until they go to construction. And they're not going to construction. Yeah. They're in the PUC process right now. That plan could change again. We're not going there because that one can't be met. They wouldn't have asked us to confirm it's been met when it can't be met. The issue is over the 25% slope. And right now, this is what we have to react to. And if we attach this plan to it, when we send it up to the PUC, and we state that it was done by a firm and all these different things that we relied on to make that decision, that's the best we can do. The reason that this is up in front of you to decide is because that's what Norm Solar decided to offer you to look at. They but didn't the offer PUC you. is going to see that's what we made our decision on. Uh, if right, they get to it and say, whoa, this right. is so different from, we actually want the town to look at version 6 and tell us what they think of that, they'll send it back to us again. Uh, unclear, but... Um, um, do, do we need a motion to authorize the drafting of, authorize Trevor to draft a letter subject to the conditions that you have? Yep. Stipulated? Yes. So moved. Okay. Second. We have a motion and a second on the table. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So no motion discussion carries. here. The motion's made? Yeah, it's moved. The letter will be drafted, and the board will have a chance to comment on it. 
and then it'll come out. It'll go to the PUC and be copied to both of you. I think their order said if you didn't agree with it, there would be 14 days to file something after it was filed. Yes, well, to we'll point out, out that uh, you didn't uh, do you know, satisfy the condition in the letter. So. You can, you can. That's your right. Okay. Thank you. All right, Thank next you. up is a preliminary discussion on local option taxes. Times. Just in the back, it's just some very preliminary information. At one point, I was going to try to provide you with both a pathway and an estimated yield, and I thought maybe I'd step back and see where you wanted to be first um, before we went into that. So, we got sort of two separate pieces to this. Um, one is just the general policy conversation on local option taxes. I think everybody knows what they are it's the 1% surcharge. We gross 70% of that. State takes the other 30%. We see some of it back as pilot payments. They use it to pay their property tax, basically. Um, and then uh, there's an administrative charge that's applied from the local share for processing this by the, by the state through the Department of Taxes. I'll give you a conservative estimate between 2.5% and 5% of whatever that gross tax yield would be, probably closer to 25 What it is, how it shakes out, what it depends on, we'd model it based on I guess there are three different times to file, and so we essentially would split those into thirds in terms of each amount and combine them all and come up with an idea. Until we were up and running, you wouldn't know sort of what that trajectory is, but it can alter what that administrative fee comes out to be based on how people file. Um, people being the those running operations that are subject that have to collect the tax and then remit it um, to the state. The thornier question, well not the thornier, the more mechanical question for us is how do you get there? We're not one of the 14 or so municipalities that was authorized post Act 60 to do this. Um, so for us this is a charter based process, charter based approval. It's laid out there, we've talked about it before, the articles of merger. I think at one police committee meeting I described it as a platypus because <laughs> it's a mammal that functions not like a mammal at times too. Um, <laughs> It, and really, because it's referred to as a charter, it functions a little bit as a charter, and we talk about the police district, but it's not listed with the municipal charters in the Title 24 appendix, which is an indication to me, at least, that it's not considered a mammal like the other mammals and, you know, the poor platypus kind of thing. But um, we'd need to settle that question because the adoption process is a little different than the amendment process. Um, the amendment would be looking for a discrete section to throw in the adoption process. Now we've got to write sort of a whole charter that meets those um, qualifications. There's a best case we'll, we'll, best case scenario that's a year. We would we would if we decided we wanted to go down that road, like yeah. we would we would just figure that all out, right? It's not going to really influence whether we decide like this is a good idea or not a good idea. It's really just going to be like, okay, we'd yeah. like to do this. How do we actually make it happen? If we don't want to do it, then it's completely moved. Yeah, just yeah. trying to provide the whole roadmap. It's road just map. given kind of like, here's some of the hurdles we're going to face. Right. Like, and I think first, mm -hmm. we're going to end up having to figure out that whole thing anyway. Yeah. Like, is it a merger document only? Is it a charter? Is it a quality? Like, what is the beast that we're operating under? Because it's coming. Like, we're going to deal with it now under the police issue in that discussion. We're it's going to come up in local options, and we do have a resident who's come forward and asked for um, non-citizen voting. So all of those are charter changes in towns that have a charter. We have this kind of funky thing going there. So like, we're going to need to get legal counsel to tell us, like, what is this beast and what is it? Because we've got a variety of issues that it's, it's going to play a role in the process. But you're right, whether we do it or don't do it, isn't that isn't part of that discussion it's how do we do it that it becomes in the timeline right like if we got to write a whole charter and get it adopted and then go to the legislature and get them to take it on and, and all that that's a, a longer process so it's kind of it plays into that timeline sure. piece also so so the decision before us Tonight is whether to just continue exploring this further, 
Right. Yeah, I mean, we can model some of the pieces out the expected yield. There aren't any restrictions on the uses of the funds other than the restrictions you have on public funds anyway, so we can't use them to buy influence, basically, mm -hmm. um, do illegal things. Um, mm -hmm. But by it's no large, parties for the select board. It's no... <laughs> that actually might still be legal enough, so you can have yourself a heck of a... Jeez. Heck of a no, shindig. I, I, think, I think we're really, this is really just about like just starting a conversation. Yep. Like, why mm -hmm. might we want to do such a thing? And well, what would be, and what would be, the, what, what would be the pros and cons, right? Yep. What does it look like? What are the impacts? Whatever. Mm -hmm. What would be used? Well, you know, what's the money for? Mm -hmm. yep. and, and towns have used it for everything from general fund revenue sources to, um, I think, St. Albans Town uses it for a very specific purpose. St. Albans City, as well, was referenced as one that uses it for a specific police-related purpose. Others have tied it to capital funds and just have goosed capital funds. Um, and anyway, so there's, there's kind of a broad sense of the usage. Some places have all of them that are enabled, so rooms, meals, um, alcohol, and general sales. Cannabis is broken out as a separate data point. But as I've always understood it, if we levied it, it's essentially a general sales tax. It just gets tacked on to the 10 or 11, whatever the percent excise tax is now on that product. Um, and so some levy a few of them, some levy others. So if you're, you know, and I mean, it's individual stuff. So for us, we'd have to determine, is there, is it all of them? Is there some of them? Is, what, is there an appropriate mix? based on geographic location, based on community profile. Woodstock, I think, what it gives does... it all to their economic development commission. And do they do the sales, or are they just rooms and meals and rooms alcohol? And rooms and meals and alcohol, so, but not sales. Yep. Yeah, so they're hitting the visitor but it demographic. But amounts to a significant... It's yeah. $500,000 a year. I think... I wonder if Stowe's in the same boat. Where and, they might. and they use it entirely for economic development and marketing and tourism marketing yep. initiatives. And then they give about one hundred and eighty-five, two hundred thousand dollars in grants a year to community organizations and individuals, but all with an economic development mm -hmm. and housing. Now they're doing housing initiatives mm -hmm. too, and they're they're layering that up. Workforce housing development has become a, uh, a central way they're using it. I don't see us getting five hundred thousand a year. Hmm? I don't see us getting five hundred thousand oh, no, a year out of this. Probably, probably not. <laughs> You're definitely not Woodstock. <laughs> it's one of those things. It's hard to calculate individually. There are no restrictions on where we allocate no. the funds. Right? Not unless we put them. It's on interesting ourselves. that the state gets thirty percent, but then they tack on another two and a half to five. Why don't they just say we get twenty-five percent and be done with it? Okay. But, yeah. you know. I, I think I wonder if some of that's tied to there was a for years a general hesitation out of the on the House side in the Ways and Means Committee on how broad what should be the mechanism, yeah. you know, whose taxing authority and you know, fit into roles and responsibilities. And so it tended to be, let's make it keep it charter based because for years the league has been asking for just let everybody do it by vote you know generally enable it um, as opposed to making it a charter based provision. Because mm -hmm. yeah, well, they're going to have to do something. The more we start digging into these things where there's these mandates and no way to fund them, that's, you know, you can't just keep tacking it onto the property tax. That's yeah. getting. It's, I think we did this the last budget. I forget exactly what the percentage was, but property taxes are 80 plus percent of our revenue portfolio when you look at it like that, I think, if I'm remembering right. I remember I went to a conference in my league days and one of the folks from Oklahoma handed out a flyer they had used in their advocacy efforts that just sort of showed they were trying to make the case for more um, flexibility and revenue sources and they handed this thing out it was a dollar bill and it had different color coded sections I'm looking at this thing and there's like 12 different revenue like 15 and not we're not talking about like dog licensing fees and the really small like every kind of tax like it was crazy how many choices they had and they're saying well these aren't enough choices for us and I'm looking at this thing going heck if we had half of these <laughs> you know, what it opens up in terms of what every community can decide to do or not do. Um, but for now, this is when you're this talking, is what this is what we got. It's property taxes, some fees, but they're never going to be any bigger than what they are, really, in this. Um, yeah. So in the art of the possible, this is 
Just what level of data can the tax department share with the town when they're doing this analysis? Can we, they show us? We can go and grab that? everything from multiple. They put their data up by calendar and fiscal year. So we go up and grab it for whatever unit we want and then see by category what those sales are and actually come up with a pretty good approximation of what 70% mm -hmm. would be. And then I'd have to reach back out to the folks there. When I was in Waitsfield, they provided me with a way to estimate the administrative cost. And it was basically take the number of filers per category and split them into thirds. And then I forget, there was a piece to it that I can't remember that you apply, you know, the factor you multiply by. Um, but they've got a way that they've recommended that, and it's a total approximation, but at least gets us started on that piece. Give us some idea. I mean, if so, we're chasing 10 grand, it's probably not worth it if we're chasing yeah something much bigger. The wrinkle is if for some reason we have a category that has less than 10, I think it was, for example, in certain categories, in which case they don't provide the data for privacy concern because you might be able to figure out who reported what. This was the, I don't know if this is still, this is a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. So in that Mad River Valley example, Faiston, which just has Mad River Glen, Mount Ellen basically on that half of Sugarbush, doesn't have the volume. So there were certain data types where they were just showing zero, but you know that there's revenue. Mm -hmm. So there might be some gaps, it, and I don't know if we can get that from them or not. So but. here's a, that makes sense. But yeah. I'm wondering, so like, when you actually get the tax revenue, mm -hmm. the total, like let's say you, 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 you actually have this process in your town, and you get the total amount of money that is raised, you know that number. Like, mm -hmm. you know how much money was raised by whichever of the um, taxes you, you have mm -hmm. so can't can we get projected data that would give us those same numbers because if those numbers don't compromise privacy or even if they do like they're out there in the public like so why shouldn't potential numbers also be possible it just seems like we ought to be able to get the total it, just a like they might not you know they they might be able to break it down in certain categories, but then for the ones where it's too small, they just lump them all together, add it to the, to the other one that we know of, and just give us one final number, just like they would if we actually instituted it and we got the taxes. We'd know that same number. We'd have to request that separately. That'd be the question, because the way the data is available now is by those categories. Right, so I'm saying, can we ask them so we, we can make ask. a more informed judgment yeah. of exactly not exactly, but approximately how much money we'd really be talking about because it seems like some of those small categories we might have, you know, a, a particular business which is generating quite a bit of, you know, revenue, mm -hmm. but they're like, but there's not that many of them. Well, the <laughs> and so it would make a difference in terms hotels, of what we might want to Yeah. <laughs> well, and there's some that we'll just, yeah. and there's some that we might, yeah, that we might expect, but we won't have data for it all. And, and, you know, what some communities are starting to look at is folding Airbnbs into, mm -hmm. of which we have several that I'm aware of. This quite, no, it's quite a few. Yeah, town. quite a few, including <laughs> mine. <laughs> um, but, um, I, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's the kind of information I think we really would, would like to see. But just to just could we get back to like, like so like why might we want to do this? Um, I think one of the reasons is that, well, we're identified lots of places where we want to spend money on really good things and we don't have the money. And one of the really nice aspects of at least the rooms and meals tax is that the money is going to come from significantly from people who are not our citizens, right? So we're gonna ask people who make use of our services, mm -hmm. who are passing through to pay for a little tiny piece, a little tiny piece of, of, what, of what they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's fair. Um, it defer diversifies our, our revenue, like Trevor was mm -hmm. saying, which is also never a bad thing. And especially for those taxes, most of the money that is spent locally on those are for things which are more in the, you can make an argument that it's not gonna be completely, and I really do get that, but a big chunk of it is gonna be so, more sort of on the sort of non-essentials, right? Like, we are not we don't force anybody to spend the night in a hotel, we're not gonna, we don't force anybody, no one needs to go out to eat, and things like that. So, you know, it feels like if we're gonna 
have a tax which seems fair and which doesn't impact lower income folks, that at least that feels like a reasonable place to start saying, what would that really look like? I think you gotta be careful though on the other side of what is the impact of it. Absolutely. Right. So, I'm just saying that's where that's right. the impetus. I'm saying right. that's where I, I get that's, that's where the, the positive dis- side of that's it. That's where the discussion it's the that's what prompts the discussion. Yeah. And should we be careful? Should we do a lot more due diligence? Should we really know what we're getting into? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, I think you've got some businesses that are teetering right now and if you lose enough we're customers and Yeah. Well, that's a that's a whole other story. Yeah. But well well but <laughs> Yeah. Um, if I could jump in here, guys. Um, hi, everybody. Hey, Stephanie. Hey. Bye. Hey. Um, yeah, so I um, have already kind of spoken my opinion to some of you guys about this, but as a small business owner of something, I think you guys are kind of leaning against retail right now, but the smaller retail businesses in town are also competing against all the online people who are already cheaper with free shipping. Um, I would just... I, I just think we should be a little bit careful about the impact of what it would do to our businesses. Um, it might seem small, but it could actually maybe have a huge impact on what we are doing. Um, and like Trini kind of said, a lot of us are teetering. And so we're getting by, but it wouldn't take much to push some of the, these businesses over the edge for sure. So yeah. just some thoughts. You know what we should do, Stephanie, is we should get the legislators to pass a bill that sets it up so if your zip code, I don't know, because we want the visitors. I wasn't thinking, if your zip code, they, they goes by zip code now, right? So when you go to Amazon and you buy something on Amazon, you pay your Vermont tax, the option tax should be on there if it's being shipped to, you know, a zip code that's got a local option tax that should be 7% instead of 6%. Good stuff shipped to Springfield. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Just thinking, like, the other, yeah. you really want to gain the, uh, uh, protect another, the local business. Another, yeah. another piece that I think would be interesting to know more about would be um, if, if we were to, you know, because what I, what I would really like to see is, for, is if, we, if we were to go down this path, would, would be for this money to take the place of, not to not just add, not to add additional resources so much, as much as it would be to... Um, help us pay for things that we need to pay for, that we're going to pay for. And so what would be the impact on property taxes if we got this money? Like, would, would businesses that are paying property taxes, would they then pay less property taxes that would take off, you know, some of the, you know, you gain some here and you lose some there kind of thing. Like, what does that look like? And that's probably complicated, and maybe it doesn't amount to anything, but it would be part of the puzzle to, to know, like, mm-hmm. what does that balance look like? Could be whether you decide to supplement or supplant in terms of how you use the funds. Yes, and that exactly. And then one of the things that we'll have to try to, if we really get into the conversation, we'll want to try to figure out and be thoughtful about ways to mitigate the unexpected impacts that we have unfortunate recent history with in place of the local option taxes. So pandemic and floods, especially if you're doing, I mean, if you're doing any of them and they hit in certain places. And so making sure that we're always mindful of insulation too. So that ties into that supplement versus supplant so that we don't suddenly find ourselves. Right. That, that's, that would be an argument for supplanting, right? Instead to to say or we're not going to raise as much money in property tax because we're raising it through the local option tax in, instead. And so that way, if you had a, a catastrophe which affected the local option tax, then you can say, well, we just need to raise property taxes. But we would have, if we didn't have the local option tax, we would have had to have raised them anyway to do these things that we have to do, right? Is, am I hearing maybe. you correctly? Maybe. I maybe. think the appeal is that you set it up so that maybe the proceeds go into, say, your capital reserves. So then if your revenues bottom out, theoretically you should have oh, some yeah, sort of savings sure. account built up. That's, no, that's a great idea. So To keep so, going and then... So it could go into a capital reserve mm-hmm. that, in some sense, would have otherwise been paid for through property taxes. But you wouldn't necessarily... But it might be that instead of saying 
well, this year we need to raise this much money because net, because otherwise we have to cut a whole department or do something that we really don't want to do. Instead, we could say, we're not going to put as much money into the, this particular capital fund this year. Or we're going to delay a project. Or we're going to, yeah, right. and it's going to delay. Revenue, we're and just going to delay, delay a project. It'll delay a project, but it's not, but it's not going to right. have the kind of, it's not going to make a cut in service, for example. Yeah. The worst choice might be to tie it directly to debt service payments, especially if they're larger, because... We got to pay that when it comes due, no matter no matter what. No, so that, that would be some have done it, but that would be the one. That to, does no. The idea of dedicating this to, if we were to do it, to dedicate it to a capital reserve, that that makes a lot of sense. And then the capital reserve just goes up or down by more or less than we think it's going to. And we have this already, right? When we have sometimes we have surpluses that go into a capital reserve, and sometimes they're big, and sometimes they're non-existent. Um, and that's how we deal with that. We just take that money and we just throw it into the capital reserve. I think before we get to the conversation on what we do with the money, we got to figure out if we're going to even do it. But and I, but it, it gives a lot of, of legwork. But it's part of yep. whether it, what we're going to do with it informs whether it's worth doing. Right? So I think yeah. we do need to think about it's a, where it's going to, how we would make use of those funds if we had it and what that would look like. I think it's all part of the part of the picture that we need to think about. Oh, I, it's definitely part of the picture, but like, again, are we talking $10,000 or are we talking $30,000? Right. Are we talking, <coughs> I think that's yeah. step one. Like, is oh, it even oh, worth yeah. all much this time oh, oh, ab for nothing? No, ab absolutely, how much money are we talking about? We need yeah. to know that. For, that's, we need to know that first. I, I and is, is it even worth? Field, so we can plug in our numbers and then we'll calculate out. So we can, we can probably come up with yield fairly quick. It's just filling in a couple of the holes. There was one category, I forget which, where there was nothing reported, but that we know we have businesses. Um, just to kind of chime in with that idea, though, Larry, um, of it would cut back in property taxes, maybe. Um, a lot of us lease our buildings, so yep. um, our landlords are the ones that would be paying that, and um, I, I think we more than, it like won't matter. Yeah, I, we'll I think, the same yes, matter. yes, no, I, I, I understand that, I, and I, I should have mentioned it as, as I was talking about. I, yes, you're completely right. We would just, it would be one of those things that would be great if we had data about what that would look like. And, and maybe we just can't get it. Maybe that's just something we're not going to be able to wrap our minds around, and we, we won't be able to use that as a justification or, or otherwise. Thank you. Uh, that out. Um, yeah, and there might be a way that we can just talk. I mean, I know how much I pay in my retail taxes every year um, for my business, um, and so we might even be able to get a general idea just from talking to businesses of, you know, if we can't get the data um, of just directly getting it from the businesses and just talking to them about how they would feel about all of this too. Yeah. Oh, it'll be quite a process oh, to get to it. There's a like an education portion and a outreach and all kinds of good stuff. But step one is to figure out, I think, you know, what is it? What are we chasing? Yeah. So I can do the yield estimates and then I gotta be honest with you, I want that I want the platypus question answered. That one's really starting to bug me. Send it to the lawyer. Well it sounds like a good good thing to do either way. Like yeah. how do we decide about local option Cause, taxes? Because we're gonna be in the other some. question one way or the other, yeah. It would be nice to sort yeah. of have that. Yeah. What is it? For for future. Yeah. For the future, whatever we decide. Okay. Any other thoughts on that one? We're done with that one. Landowner access agreement with Ridgeline. We sent this around to you earlier. There was a suggested language change. We heard back from the Conservation Commission members. They're okay with it. Everybody's okay with it. It basically takes language in Section 2C and makes it a little more flexible. So this is the may temporarily close off trails or parts of trails for reasonable and necessary public purposes. The prior version limited it more or less to safety and emergency measures. The water supply project's a good example of where there might be other stuff. It's yep. hard to see with like say word where we're gonna run into the other stuff, but it's nice to have that flexibility sure. on our land and not have to, similar yeah. to the conservation Let's... easement on Ellis where we had to threaten to condemn our own property. <laughs> <laughs> to the extent we can avoid that. And so this would put in place a landowner agreement that we haven't had before, clarifies roles, responsibilities, makes things really clear. It's a good practice 
These are with good partners, um, and that it's Ridgeline and uh, the Vermont Mountain Bike Association. So plenty of experience from both with these types of things, and we get to serve as a nice little model as they build out these types of agreements as well. And it helps tie into a grant that Limbo <coughs> wants to go for on behalf of Ridgeline. We'll do some trail improvement work from Sayward pretty much exclusively, right? That's yeah, what Morgan's been hanging out for is in her dual hats here. Yeah, so this was supposed to be on the last month's agenda, but that was even longer than this tonight. Um, but that grant application is due tomorrow, and in some change of guards, we found that a lot of these landowner access agreements were never formalized in the Randolph networks. Um, so this is something we do across the board with all of our private and public landowner partners, and the the point of it is to protect the interests and respect and recognize uh, the best interest of the landowner partner first. So did anybody have any questions other than the one that got fixed? When I read through those, the only thing that's, that popped out to me, everything else seemed pretty standard. Anybody want to make a motion to accept it? I'll make a, a motion to uh, accept the updated proposed zoning bylaw amendments. Oh, I'm sorry. Second. I'm reading the, I'm reading, I'm reading the next thing down. Yeah. I, I got ahead of myself there. Hang on a second. <laughs> I it jumped on to another page. So. Uh, landowner. Yeah, the landowner agreement. I'll make a motion that we um, accept the landowner agreement as modified. Second. A motion and a second to accept it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We have one abstention with Larry being out. Update on the proposed zoning bylaw amendments. This has been hanging out. We talked about it last time. The idea was to give you some time to review to consider, to come up with any further questions you may have. Um, we can go back and revisit individual pieces. I mean, it's a little bit later. This was packed. I did not want to lose this. There's a time element tied to a grant, but as I've said to you before, the choice is between getting it right and blowing through a grant deadline. <laughs> and then we blow through the grant deadline. Um, so I looked at this and have concerns about this in a few different areas. Um, one of the challenges I see is that we're now taking this down to 5,000 square feet for a home. Um, and buildings can be 30 feet apart, 15 foot setback from both property lines. 30 feet is pretty tight. If you got 15 feet to get equipment in and do any type of work on your home, that's not very much space coming from the construction side of you, I can tell you we wouldn't be able to do it if we had to get up on the roof or any major thing. But my bigger concern is ha I haven't seen anything where we've looked at what the impact of this is. Like if you put a house on every 5,000 square feet in the town, and I know it won't happen, but we're like tripling the housing stock in Randolph. That increases your need for municipal resources. How do we pay for all that? Like, I, and I know like zoning doesn't get built out and, and it isn't that quick, but <clears throat> if I understand correctly, some of the predictions are that with this change in just to the buildings that are there now, right, taking a large home and splitting it into two residents and changing the garage into a home too and whatnot, could potentially bring 100 new families into Randolph within the first year. That's a big number. I mean, first off, I don't think it's going to happen. I think that's a very unrealistic mm -hmm. value. But like that alone is a big number. Um, the full build out is, I think, but around 400 or 400, five, like that, yeah. 400 500 families. But like, I don't know that we've evaluated the impact on municipal resources. Like, what is our what is our demand? Like, what does that do to the demand for but fire doesn't, coverage. Doesn't it bring, I mean, resources as well? And, and 
I mean, if there's a hundred more families living in town, there's a hundred more people paying taxes and not necessarily and though, right? Visiting businesses. Well, I think the question is like, what does what does that look like built out, and what is the revenue that would come to the town? Like, if you're taking a home and making it a duplex, what's the difference in the grand list value for that? It shouldn't be much, right? You just added a wall, you know. You know what I mean? Like, that building is now a duplex. If if you're taking a garage and you're changing it into a home, you probably have some change in the grand list. I would think the value of a home on the grand list versus a garage would be a little bit higher, but I, I, I apologize for stepping out. Can you tell me the question you're responding to? Oh, we're talking about the changes in the bylaws and the housing part of it. Mm -hmm. And like where the, if you look at the density that's allowed now, we're just talking about like the high density area, the 5,000 square feet and houses able to be 30 feet apart. but. Like, what's the impact to the town when we, if we do that? And I'm not against adding housing. That just to me seems like a lot. Like that's a big transition to go from, you know, go down to 5,000 square feet and to, and we're also adding the ability to, which I think is great to take these old houses that are there and give them some flexibility in what they can be in the, in the uh, garages and, carriage sheds that were with a lot of those buildings give them a use but it just feels like coupling that on with a lot of these other changes that's that's a pretty drastic change so you're talking about and specifically i just want to make sure i understand your your point is that because mo most of the changes um are are um, in response to the change in state statute mm -hmm. um, but the ones that but there's a couple that aren't and one of them is the minimum is the decreased minimum lot size in the high density areas. That's what you're specifically. Yeah, what I'm trying to get my head around is if you look at every 5,000 square foot, you could have a house, right? Like, what does that mean for the town? Like, right. when we're making a change that big, we should be looking at what is that going to do for demand on the public services? Like, what is the, what is, what's the impact of that? Right. Can you say something, Tom? No. You're going to get revenue generated from that. Right, but you're is about it... new construction? construction? If it's new construction, right? Some of these will be just changing over existing structures. Right. Which, I, it's, to me, that's an yeah. easy one, but it's not going to have a huge... Right. There's not a huge change there to the, to the grand list, dwelling right? All that accessory stuff, all the duplex stuff, that's all required of us by statute. And, but, but there's going to be an impact to it. Right, right, but we don't have a choice as to whether accept that or not. Agreed, but we know the, the quantity of that, right? We only have so many structures in, in the area that can be changed into that, right? right. So we, we have that number. That's an impact that's coming. We still don't know what that could be, right? But that, to me, isn't going to bring you in a lot of extra tax revenue, right? So we now have a mandate from the state to allow accessory dwellings and whatever, and to, for these structures to be split. But there isn't gonna be a lot of tax revenue. Taking a house from a single family home to a duplex isn't gonna change the value of it much for a grand list piece. The garage might change some, but I don't see it being a huge amount. Right, right. I, I'm just, here's my concern is that if we take all this as one and we run with it all in one, we could find ourselves going, shit. How are we going to afford this? Like, it's. We struggle like, to meet service expectations now. But I guess what I, what I want to point out, though, is that 95% of the changes are statutes, are by statute. Like, we don't, we actually don't have a choice. We're just conforming to state statute. The, the one exception is, is minimizing, is, is making the minimum lot size smaller. It's, and that's and, the, and so that's the one we have control over. Well, that's the one you're talking about. That that's the one that has the biggest impact to us. So with no the five known, acre, that five acre piece too. Yeah, I got an issue with one. that one too. I was yeah. taking them one at a time, but the it's the yeah, 
Like, did they, was there anything done in the planning commission to say this change is going to create this demand or yeah. this? I can tell you about what my recollection of our discussion was. Um, in terms of making the minimal lot size smaller, um, one, one consideration was that we already have many lots, uh, many lots that are already smaller than 5,000. Um, and, and many that are between, I think it's, I think the current minimum is 10 or 12. And we already have many that are between those sizes um, as well, that are kind of grandfathered in you know, when, when the zoning happened. So we have precedent for it. And we already have places in town where it exists, and it seems to be OK. Are they non-conforming lots? Well, Currently, I mean, they, they don't, be. yeah, I mean, they're, I guess they must be non-conforming because they don't, but they but they were already in place, so mm -hmm. we couldn't undo them. Um, and I think the other part of the, the calculation is that there's, there's so much, there's so much pressure for increased housing that in some way or another, that pressure is going to be is going, needs to be relieved somewhere, um, especially if we want to have impacts on on local housing costs. And so, if we can do something to make it easier to or less costly to build in the already developed areas, it could take some of the pressure off people who are trying to build in less developed areas. And if we're going to have a new unit of housing built, I, I personally would much rather see it happen. In, in the already dense village where it's already on water and sewer and we don't have to construct new power lines and we don't have to make new roads and we don't have to add traffic to dirt roads which are already hard to maintain um, than, than to see that building happen outside the district. So I think that's part of the, the vision that, that I personally have taken to heart when thinking about didn't, you know, increased development is coming where do we where do we want it? Are we just going to say no, we don't want it, or are we going to say, okay, we can have some increased development, but we want it in these places? My concern is controlling the volume. Yeah, you know, I. Well, it's like it, how do you I, do I it think, in a managed way versus just? Yeah, I, I mean, I think like, I think much of that is just going to happen naturally. I mean, it's not like we're suddenly going to have a rush of people saying, oh. Now I can subdivide my in-village lot and, like, you know, that's, it just doesn't really Plus, how much happen. I mean, have it's, you looked at what, what the volume of, I mean, how many lots are there, really, I mean, realistically? That could be realistically divided yeah. to, to, to do this? I mean, yeah, I don't know. Be, and that's what's missing, right? Like, what does this look like? What is the... When you did the, when you made the decision to go down to five thousand, there wasn't anything that said we have twenty lots that this could apply to versus a hundred lots this could apply to. Like, I guess what I'm trying to get my head around is like mm -hmm. what 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 was the what's the data on this that shows kind of what this might be, what the impact might be? Like, if you're gonna have a whole bunch of houses, is our water system gonna be able to handle that? We have lots of capacity. We, in fact, that's an argument well, for putting more units in town is because we have a we, we have we have a lot of capacity in the water district for and sewer district. Um, for sewer, I agree with you. Water, though, I'm not. Um, it's certainly sure my, that's that. my, my understanding is that we have plenty of capacity. We capacity. If we move Pearl Street to reserve capacity, and it turns out the North Wells are on the low side of yield projections and you add enough units and or commercial enterprises at the same time that are high water users? That would be the question. How quick do we get to that cap? I think wastewater, thankfully, that's a, a blessing is we got plenty of that as a capacity. Yeah. Unless we become home to every cheese maker in the state or something. <laughs> Multiple brewery, and multiple brewery. breweries. I mean, breweries. Yeah. <laughs> six breweries and six cheesemakers, and we might be upside down. But. Then we have an issue. Because that's because yeah. it seems like maybe the, maybe the the constraints on the water system were more constrained than I than I thought they were. What, will but, it just be sort of the modeling of max number of units versus the capacity, especially if Pearl Street's off? 
and or the consideration is is there a way to is there a way to do something else with Pearl Street to keep that yield somewhere in the mix, somewhere down the line? Because that well is I've monstrous. I've talked to Chris about what's going to happen to Pearl Street, and he says that the plan is, from his point of view, is that we're going to keep that well operational right. and and use it as a part as you know as a part of our mix. It's just going to be a small enough percentage that we're going to meet the water quality you know yeah. standards that we're that we've currently that we've had some trouble with. Yeah, drought resilience and fire protection would be... And, so and it will be able to be there. ramped up quickly if we needed a lot of water. My understanding was the same thing. If there was a large fire or something <clears> and it would be able to come online for backup, but it wouldn't be part of the daily mix. The DEC has indicated in conversations that that makes sense, so I think there's a pathway. And then so the larger conversation will be, if it stays as it is, are there other things you can do to that well since it's already permitted we leave it online I mean you'd have to you're talking about the manganese removal really is the yeah. thing um, and there's some grant funds available they were trying to get us to, to take a look at when they're they haven't made an announcement on their availability yet but we might be able to at least explore that in a low barrier way but um, but yeah just would be seeing number of units and then calculating it at the more conservative number which is probably the state's gallons per day allocation. I don't know that we've and, ever done that model because we've the, not had a scarcity thing and, and, the, and, and the, Heinsberg way to do it every year. Yeah. And if, if I remember right, about two thirds of the local wastewater wastewater bills is, is on the wastewater side. And so, and so if if we did have more users on the on, on, who are you know paying into the system it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna help keep those bills down and we have, we're getting it, we're, right. and we're, we're at a point right now where we're just, to, we're going to need to raise rates so very soon, because it's been a long time since we've raised yeah, right. water, wastewater rates. So the idea of being able to add people to the system, most of the system costs are fixed. You know, it's, it costs a certain amount of money to run the system, it doesn't matter, you know, you know, it almost doesn't matter how much water we use and go through the, 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 the septic plant. Um, and so the more users we have, we, we just lower the per capita costs. Mm -hmm. like, Almost one to one, not, not quite, but it's pretty close. I completely agree with you. As long as we have the water to serve them, like that's my concern. Is at what point do we right. well, max I, I out and have to add more capacity? Yeah, I, I, where my my like where I said, my, under, my understanding was that we're we're not close to tapping out the amount of you know like we're going to run out of water. I didn't I didn't I've never heard of that as being an issue. Well, I knew we were going to drop capacity, right? Like if we take Pearl Street off, even bringing these on, we're lower. We're not meeting quite the same production as we can get out of Pearl Street. So Pearl I don't know what that does to it. It's a huge capacity. It's crazy, the capacity of that. Right. But I think any changes that we're talking about here in terms of, like, how many new d units are going to happen, I mean, we're talking about this happening over decades. Like, it's, it's, this isn't something that's going to happen you hope. in the next couple of years. But in that Heinsberg example, they did a similar thing, conservation subdivision regulations, try to drive everything into downtown. They knew the infrastructure wasn't there to support it, thinking it was a 40, 50 year proposition. Within three years, they had applications for 500 units. I mean, I know it's a different example, but it, totally different it, it can happen. Heinsberg. The things you think can't happen, can happen. Is I didn't it, is expect it theoretically to possible? Sure. Is, yeah. it, is it likely? I, I don't think it's likely. I don't think it's likely. I never thought we'd spend an hour talking about a remand from the PUC. <laughs> Which <laughs> you talking about Schrodinger's cat for an hour. Is it alive or dead? It just you always gotta make decisions on the best available data. You can't you know, you can be wrong. We're gonna make decisions that are wrong. We can't be afraid to be wrong. Yeah. Look at them all right, don't the only we? other one I had brought up before you came back in in fairness was the fifteen foot setback for houses. Like you can't do much in fifteen feet. So, like, getting equipment in there to do repairs on a house and whatnot, 15 feet is pretty tight. I don't recall changing the setback out. Is that again in the high density? Yeah, 11. It says, well, I'm assuming that's where it is. It says they changed the setbacks hmm. to 15 feet, and that's pretty tight. Perry just bought a special piece of equipment that's in that space. Yeah. <laughs> So my other switching out of the high density, um, just is the merging rural residential and rural agricultural. 
to me as a concern. We had a lot of conversation um, back when Perry was still on. Him and I sat down and looked at all the different properties about increasing the size of lots in the rural agricultural versus leaving them at five acres and keeping that to preserve agricultural use. And I'm not sure if we merge those two districts, we're going to get to that piece well, of we it. Did. When we did, when we merged them, we kept the bigger lot size of the two. Over at five acres. Yeah. Right? And Because I think so, one was two and a half and one was five. And so we made them, now they're going to both be five. But if we're going to be promoting agri-entrepreneurial, or it's just part of that word, the new word that's in there. Agripreneurial? Yeah. Is that it? Yes. <laughs> if we're going to be promoting that, um, breaking down lots to five acres isn't going to help us with that. Right? Like... The conversation was on, are we going to preserve larger blocks of land to keep it in as yeah, open I, I, and available for ag? And if we merge right. these two lots into one zone, we don't have that intent to Oh, you're saying that if we did that, then we, that you're saying the that, that you're, so what you're saying, let me, let me see if I understand you correctly. You're saying that if we merge those two zoning districts, it will make it harder for us to increase the lot size in the, in the agricultural district in the future if we so desired, if we wanted to, to if we wanted to do that, to, to to help preserve bigger chunks of agricultural land. Right, we're so, losing a district that's so, was always focused on agriculture and calling it right. Rural, but I guess I want to understand specific, like what specifically would be the problem. And what I'm what I'm hearing, it's I guess what I'm size. hearing you say is it would preclude us, not preclude us, but it would make it more difficult for us to increase the lot size from the current five acres. So you're going to have to create a whole new district to that do if that. If we wanted to do that, because we wouldn't be able to, we could, but maybe we wouldn't want to potentially do that in the residential, in the rural residential area. Right, you're going to be breaking the district out to then change the lot sizes. Right. If we're serious about trying to create the ability for farms to have yeah, no, that's, other uses, that's, um, then it feels like we yeah. ought to be keeping an ag district and increasing the lot size versus keeping that. I think it's the ag side that had the five acres. Yes. You know, that's which, my, that's which my the whole conversation we'd had, I don't know, for quite a while was like five acres isn't enough to do much. Ag wise, right? They like wh what? It, what steps are we going to take <clears throat> if we're going to say five acres? Right now, the whole town, you know, and it could be for you know, it could be split into five acres <clears throat> for housing. So if I have a hundred acre lot and I can now have twenty houses on it, right? And so if I'm, if we're looking to preserve land to be used for ag. We haven't done that group any favors by allowing it to go down to five acres. If you have right. 25 well, acres... Well, we're, not, we're not making it go down. We're keeping it at right, five Right, but acres. having it at that five acre doesn't help us preserve that land for agriculture. Right, right, right. No, I agree. I agree. Right. That's a good point. So that did not come up in our discussion. Yeah, no, that's... I Just trying to look at, like... I, I think that's an excellent point. I think that's a really powerful argument for keeping them separate. And looking at when we redo our town plan, that do we want to you know, have a more heavy emphasis on preserving agricultural land in that district? And if so, will making the lot sizes, the minimum lot sizes bigger, um, achieve that aim? And, um, and we could hold off on making that change until then. Because you know, the, the, the impetus for all, for all these changes was simply to um, have the town plan and the and the zoning, um, in sync. you know, in sync, and so yep. um, I'm not an expert on whether this is was part of that effort or not. But we have, I think, somebody on line. Sydney is nodding her head. Sydney, can, Sydney, will you chime in? Yeah. So this was part of that um, attempt to bring the bylaws in line with what was, I believe, a the, the planning commission should consider combining these two districts um, and then the town plan and its descriptions of the 
land use areas did show them combined. Um, so the planning commission in its deliberations decided to bring the bylaws into as close of um, connection with the town plan as, as they could reasonably do. But there's no problem. I mean, the, the ability is there to keep them as two separate districts, right? It's just, it lines up better with the same, with the language in the town plan if, if they're one. Yeah. yeah. But, but I like what you're saying, Trini, and, I, and we're gonna be revising the town plan shortly, it's due. So yeah. instead of changing this, land use regulation now and then and then going and changing the town plan and then going back and changing the <laughs> land use regulations to to agree with the new town plan um, does seem a little silly um, yeah well and I think if we're going to keep this focus on open land and whatnot to that's where the size the lot size comes into play right like if you want open land and you want less development your lot sizes need to stay on the higher side to keep it from being split up into mm -hmm. small building lots. Yeah. As your farmers are getting older and whatnot, and that's, you know, in some cases, those are looked at as, well, I'll just peel off five acres and sell it, and that'll fund me for the next few years, and then I'll peel off another. Uh -huh. And so slowly you would end up creeping into not having ag land, which is then. Yeah. Gonna be look a, at some other neighboring states. I don't want to be at, them. That's, that's what they. That's what they look here. like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we don't want. We don't want. We don't, we don't want that. I don't. I don't want that. I should say. And the other one, I just I need to go and look at the language on it. But it's um, the subdivision using a road and river as a natural subdivider. And I, I had a good conversation with Mark about it today. <laughs> I get his side of it, and I agree with him on his side of it, and he now gets my side of it and agrees with that, but we don't know how to marry the two up, so mm. I need to look at that a little better, but um, it's... I wish I could have been there for that conversation. <laughs> yeah, it was really good. Um, we get along great, so it was all friendly. Um, Mark it was is wonderful. more of a, okay, so, you know, and I get his part, like, if you, if you own a parcel and you have three acres on one side of the river, and you want to sell it off to somebody and let them build a house to finance something or to do whatever, right now you can do that, right? Because it's a natural subdivider. And, but you also then have this parcel you can't do anything with except maybe sell to an abutter, right, on the other side of the property. And so then I gave him my example, which is we do own a parcel of land and we don't want to do anything with it. So this isn't all in self-preservation, but I know this is out there in other places. A half acre is on one side of the road the 17 acres is on the other side of the road. And we really only needed the half acre, but we had to buy the whole parcel to get it. And it's used for an agriculture building, pump shack for the sugaring operation. I either got to keep four and a half acres on the other side, which means all the land that gives you access to it because the rest of it's down over a bank, um, and then subdivide and sell off the part that's over the bank or to keep the whole thing and keep paying taxes on it. And all I need is that half acre, but I'm not gonna put a house on it, right? Like I'm not doing anything like that. So his concern is housing. Like you build a house on that portion, but an accessory ag building is a different issue. And you know, could you subdivide yeah. that property so that that smaller portion that you're gonna use for something other than housing or a commercial business could be done on it, but not then can you put a building restriction type thing on that property? So that was the conversation the two of us had. And we both agreed with each other's position. We just don't know how to word it right, to, to right. get both. And maybe, maybe there's no way to do it, right? Maybe you just have yeah. to pick one and pick the one which is going to work best, even though it's not going to work. Uh, we kicked everybody. around a few ideas, so we're going to play with the language right, on that no, one just, too, I'm, and see I'm if we can make it, it work. That'd be great. Yeah. If, you can, if you can come up with something which will address both of your concerns, that's the best. That's that obviously yeah. is the idea. And then we did get into a. I, I know we exchanged an email. We never got to sit down and talk about it, but um, during an Act 250 hearing, 
a larger parcel, it was over 100 acres, um, 12 acres was needed for the commercial development and the river was a natural divider. Route 14 and the river were two dividers and we didn't want to give them jurisdiction over the rest of the property. So we argued that that was a natural subdivider and they shouldn't have jurisdiction over the rest of the land. And we ended up winning because there was nothing in the town zoning rules that said you couldn't use the road or the river as a subdivider. So like that's an unintended consequence that this would cause for the next person that might try to do that. And when you look at the properties down through, we got a lot of properties that follow the river that might be able to benefit from that. So, you know, it was just more of a interesting. But having the road in the river not be a natural subdivider for a housing lot, I think is is good. I just don't know how that plays out in practice. So Right. And we only had that discussion today, so in fairness, <laughs> we haven't had much time to do the rest of it, but that's just something that that I think we got to clarify a little bit in there. Okay. Those are my three. Anybody else have any? Did you read them, Tom? <laughs> I, I, yeah. 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 It's pretty much, as Larry said, like, you know, 95% of it's mandated. <clears throat> right, so. Yeah. It's either mandated okay. or it's just makes sense and it's not yeah, contentious. Yeah. Yeah. There's these few things which oh. are more significant. Do you want to try to resolve them all in one set or do you want to try to do peel off the ones for which there's l limited choices and or broad agreement and move those ahead? You're not sure well, I think the ones that are are mandated we ought to just push forward and we don't have any say in those it, like they're right we just need to are, we just are. need to conform the statute yeah it's just really very simple yep. I think it would be good though for us to <laughs> to look at what the impact of that is because mm -hmm. at some point here we're gonna be asked to start putting together kind of all these changes that we have to make what the impacts are and and this is a smaller one than some of them, but it is one. So, like, some of these changes where we're taking a, a single home now and making it a duplex, we're not going to get any grand list value out of that, but we're going to add people. And I'm not saying adding people to town isn't a good thing, but it increases the cost of the public services, you know, whether it's additional rec program or it's kids in the school or it's whatever. And they're all good things, but there's an expense to them. Like, and we keep getting these hand-me-downs that seem good and they are great public policy, but there's an expense to them and we don't get any flexibility from the state level on ways to raise money to pay for some of this stuff. And I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what the funding source is, but it's just. You know, most, mo the whole duplex thing is sort of moot because we, our zone, zoning already allows two single family homes to be converted to duplexes on, in all the high density areas already. Like we've already made that change quite a while ago. Didn't what this the, say like some of these are going to three or four or more than that though? I'd just be using duplex because it was easy. Yeah, I'm That's just, probably what we'll see. And, and in fact, I don't imagine fact, we'll or, see many of these go and to in four. A lot of, and in a lot of places you can put already put a lot more units like like, where, like my house, the lot size is, is a third of an acre, and, and we have enough space that we could have four, no, th I think three. We could have three units of housing where there's one right now. Um, and either, either ADUs or tiny just, house or really Just the, according to our zoning, you can just break it up and, yeah. and make it into, like we could, we could make our, our house, barn, Conglomeration into a triplex if you want right, to. Right, sure. Yeah. yeah. According to current yeah. zoning. So we're, we already yeah. have a lot of this baked in. And we're not, and I don't know that we're really seeing tons of conversions. No, and I, I think some of this is, um, I think where you're going to see the change is as the baby boomers continue to age out of the homes they're in, right? Like, my understanding is a lot of these, the kids aren't interested in coming home and having this humongous Victorian home to 
to keep up or to do anything with. And that's, it's when those are turning over that that opportunity is there. Mm -hmm. right, to, and they're not all Victorian. I was just like, but, but yeah, it seems like these, a lot of them in Randolph are. A lot of big houses. Um, yeah, that, and that's where your opportunity to get it into a multi-unit is. Yeah, and for a lot of those places, it's going to be the difference between it being a property that's well maintained and one that's not, because yep. those places, single family homes, are so expensive to, to keep up. Well, a lot of these were built back when energy efficiency wasn't even thought about. Too. Some of them like are just some of them are yeah, just, some of them are just mammoth. huge. Yep. <clears throat> Imagine the parties they had in those houses, though, right? <laughs> Dang. All right. So where, where are we? So maybe what we'll do is peel off what's already sort of required, what already seems agreeable, and then at least identify the ones that maybe want more conversation, and then start to map out the steps to adopt the ones from the first category. I would, um, I would say, like, I believe the next step for us is... Um, to have the hearing on it, correct? Yeah. And so I think um, the ones that I'm more concerned about moving forward are the ones that I kind of talked about, that 5,000. Mm -hmm. I, I understand that, but I'd like to just understand how many we're talking about. Like, are we just talking a handful, which is fine, or are we talking a lot on that? And the 15-foot the setback is what's... I'm more concerned with that than I am the 5,000 because I think that's pretty tight for us to have people. But fire safety, well, we're required to have 20 feet for snow storage. Well, don't we already have 10 foot setbacks in much of the village? This says it's reducing it to 15. That might be a mistype on my end. I'm not exactly sure where you are, but if you're in the CDRV, sorry, I'm scrolling. Item 11, section RVHD. 214. Okay. I don't have the rest of the documents here with me. Um, I think the rural, residential rural ag one needs some more conversation. No, I would agree. I, I, that, on your, that one. Your, your point did not come up, and I think that is really important. Um, and I would like to still work with Mark on the language around the road river subdivider. You mind if I steal this? It's not mine, it's so not have yours. at it. Well, but it's <laughs> in your vicinity. I got two more behind me, too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Up for grabs. Oh, look at that. All right. If I, in talking with Mark, though, if I understood correctly, um, we would have the ability to knock that down so the setback was only five feet. So you could have two structures 10 feet apart in that, and that was like accessory buildings or whatever. And I don't know, you might be able to do that today, but like your, your snow load is going right onto somebody else's building that close. Like you get a good you get a good metal roof on that sucker and a nice warm day after a snowfall and that's <laughs> right into the neighbor's building. Like I'm like, whoa. Why is there snow in my bedroom? <laughs> Why is the window not working? <laughs> why yeah, why, like, why is it so cold in here? You'd want to make sure your building was a little bit taller than his, right? <laughs> so that's the, close. This, with the timing, normally I just say let's work through all of them. You got a year from when the planning commission got it to you. I'm just trying to think to some of the original, one of the original pressure points was timing related to the grant requirements. And that was why there was an idea maybe to try to split and move some to satisfy well, I those I think the majority of it can go. Yeah. Right? Like the majority keep the of others for a later time. That, that's why I think in split. I don't know if that makes any sense, but. Um, but I, I think our next sure step on that is setting that public hearing, right? The select board has to hold a hearing. Yeah. Well, I've been through this before, but my We've mind is fried some today. Some of it in a prior document Sydney, yeah. Sydney sent us to in terms of. So I think we. Well, yeah, we just have to. We have to hold backwards. that. We have to get it out there. It has to be out for a certain number of days. Then we have a public hearing on it. 
as a comment period. Then we decide if there are minimal changes that we want to make or major. <coughs> major we have to start over, but minimal we can make and keep progressing it, right? Yeah. You want us to try to aim for the first viable Thursday in January since you meet every Thursday for budget reasons or? Sure. Because depending on time. It has to be 40. Sydney, how many days does this have to be noticed for the public hearing portion? Is it 45? Or 15? No. Yeah, it's 15. 15 day notice. What's the, is there an adoption period? What? Uh, am I on the different thing? Is it ordinances that are 45? Yeah, 45 days the appeal window on a general ordinance. I think there's a 45 day thing that comes into play with the DRB as well. Yeah, it, that's definitely. Well, there's two different ones, yeah. yeah. Okay. So if we only have to do 15 day notice, we could do this. At, but don't pack that meeting with a heavy budget thing in case you get a lot of people. I mean, this could be one of those that nobody shows up at and it mm -hmm. sails right through, but it also could be one of those that gets hung up. Okay. It depends if the PUC is involved. <laughs> Cat alive? Is the cat dead? Is the cat even in there? Jeez, oh, <clears throat> brutal. <laughs> okay, is everybody good with that approach? Yeah. Okay. Let's go on. Thank you, Sydney. Thanks, Sydney. Thank you. Um, update on the police services committee. Still Not working. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I think we're still working through. There was a lot to take in after the forum. I think at the next meeting, there's going to be some more conversation with, sounds like St. Albans City, about some of the um, mental health and embedded social worker type programming that's come up as sort of, when you think back to the original scope and the question of what's a police service versus what do you maybe not need as a strictly police response and or is there are there some things that aren't police response at all so that's going to happen on monday we've got two more meetings scheduled one for this coming monday another one in january um keep talking through that and then obviously the other big question is which of the models to recommend and how to start moving toward final report well we're not going to have a final report this year i don't see it happening yeah. interim report um, was what was talked about yep. Just as an acknowledgement of kind of where we're at, especially. So, what does this mean for budgeting and for putting the what? What are we putting before the voters in March, or are we not putting anything? I, I mean, that that's an open question in terms of it. is it some version of a district budget that builds off what was already passed, or are we pointing the skis downhill and hucking it over a cliff and? Um, so and going with a, like a town-wide model would be that sort of, you know, all the way in, mm -hmm. high cost model. So I, I, I mean, but, but still what, has to what, be I'm asking that from a timing yeah. standpoint. That we have to warn. Mm -hmm. Town meeting February eighth-ish, right to eight right. somewhere in there. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the the challenge right now, Tom, is there. This we keep hearing that Clara Martin Center has a budget to pay for an embedded worker. Right. But Clara Martin Center hasn't been willing to bring it up in any of our meetings. <clears throat> and we also don't completely have our head around what that looks like. Right. So we've heard there may be three to four calls a month one time and maybe ten the next month, but that's not a full time position. So no. what does that you know, how do you work in somebody and we can't say, okay, we're going to need you on Friday at 3 p.m. and we're going to need you again Saturday at 4 a.m. Like, it's, how, how do you meet that service demand? But now there's a, there's been folks coming in talking about, um, like, when somebody is an OD, ODs, and they, law enforcement has a role in that, and then they hand them off and the ambulance takes them or you know, whatever, there's nobody doing wraparound services for that person right. to say, right. you know, let's get you into rehab, let's get you here and there. Is that a town function? 
or is that a Clara Martin Center function or is that a Gifford function or so that's the part we just don't have our hands around. Right. But what, why is that the driving topic in terms of whether we're sticking with the district, going to the expanded district, or going town-wide? I mean, it seems like it's one element of it, but for it to be the... It sounds a, like it's a core discussion right now, and I don't quite understand why well, it, that's the case. Um, well, I think it's a it's one topic. It's not the only right. one out there. Right. It's one of the pieces we just don't have our head around as far as what that service looks like and how it's delivered and who does it and where it sure. is. On the other topic, the I think some of what has to be discussed is what does that mean? Like, so let's say we decide we're going town wide. We put it out to vote in March, and the voters say yay or nay. If they say yay, we're now the the main point of contact for police services in the entire town. We don't have the law enforcement capacity to do that, right? So is it a phased approach? Do we, you know, do we vote, do we vote to um, expand the district some in year one and then some in year two and whatnot to build up? There's not enough personnel, there's not enough equipment. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we say we're it, we're it we're it. Like, VSP is no longer the primary responder to the rest of the town like they are today. Mm -hmm. So we don't think we can do that. We can't, we can't provide the service. We can't. Are, we voted we in March. Aren't we already in a situation where VSP is not providing the, the service? Cause they no, don't they're have the still staff. out there. They're, they're responding. To, their list is quite, it, you get the stats every month. Like, there's a, a pretty long list of what they're doing. And they are the primary responder. Out our way, they're the primary responder. They're showing. Right now, I know that they're that's they're the primary responder. But I was under the impression that they were often not responding to a lot of things because they're like, we can't come to calls like that because we don't have the staff. Well, I don't There's see. either lag time or they may stack them for Scott in the morning, depending on where they're at. We had a couple of examples of that, <clears throat> so it wasn't a situation that demanded an emergency response, but maybe demanded a response of some kind. So they get stacked and then Scott or his crew deal with them sort of at the beginning of the next shift, they show up. Sort of in the village, it, in the district. Yeah, do. in the district. No, then, but out our way, like, the district. yeah, you got a neighbor that's being a pain, they'll they'll show up. It may not be today. Right. But if you got an active shooter no, no, no. or if, you got something serious, something really they'll be there. there's something going on, they're gonna show up anyway, no matter yep. where it is. Like, yep. it doesn't matter. Right, the, <laughs> so the major items, they're there immediately and some of the others they may take a half hour 45 minutes to show up but they show up right. it's it's that wasn't I mean that, that wasn't what I thought I heard the officer at the public meeting said I, I, thought, I thought he said very clearly we don't have the capacity to address a, num a number of different types of call period they're 40 40, I think in the, if I read the article right, they've been out, we're talking to Chelsea recently, and they're down 40% of their staff overall in the same place. But so are we. Like, we're fishing in the same pond, as Scott says, for for officers, right? There's, there's not a large influx. The people coming into law enforcement are not equal to the number of people leaving and, and that's on an annual just, basis. I mean, there's been articles in the in the national media in recent days about okay. this phenomenon. It's not just local to no, here. But it, it's, it's a nationwide. Yep. Law enforcement's not exactly a desirable I don't blame them. The present like, I, I don't blame them. Social like, environment. Plug, plug your ears, Scott. It's a perfectly fine, <laughs> honorable choice, and you should stay with it. For, and you should stay with it forever. <laughs> Disregard everything you just heard. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean that personally, sir. <laughs> no, I, I, I get it. Thanks a lot. No, it's cool. I see what you did to me. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> so they, if, if you're going to no, mind just a little bit, you know, I... I sympathize I, I, with you. I'm not... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm hearing your discussion in regards to VSP. You know, I'm sitting over here in my office, and I'm looking at the uh, cat screen for tonight. You have three troopers that are on tonight. 
Um, you know, so their response time is minimal at best. Um, I've uh, even like last week, uh, we there was an incident here in Chandler, uh, here in the village, um, where I didn't have any officers on, um, and uh, there was an incident and they didn't show um, at all. Period. Um, so it's hit or miss with the Ross State Police. Uh, it's just really, truly hit or miss. If it's uh, a threat to life uh, and active kind of stuff, sure, they'll come. Their response times are, are, are really poor, but they will come. If it's non-life-threatening, non there's a chance they won't come. If they can't handle it by a phone call, they're not coming. So just kind of, and that's the way it's been kind of working uh, for quite a little while now. It's not every so call though. Chandler, was that life threatening? Was it somebody threatening somebody? No, so there's a lot of different opinions. I've gone through and read the cases uh, or the case that was punched for both myself and VSP. Um, and there's difference of opinions of what was being reported to what was being talked about inside jail. Uh, some of it being, yes, there was a crossbow inside an unintended motor vehicle. There was mentioned, uh, not in report, which wasn't reported, that there was a large number of firearms in the vehicle. That's never been confirmed at all. Um, and word of mouth says there was a verbal confrontation that happened uh, just outside channel. Again, that was never reported, nor is it uh, verified in any shape or form. Um, so there was really no, there was no response due to the lack of information that the reporter, who was the alleged victim in this, uh, failed to provide authorities in any shape or form. So there was no response, unfortunately. But if, uh, going to the other side of this, if we go to vote in March and we say we're going town-wide, then where, where are you at? Screwed. <laughs> <laughs> we got the picture. But, but more or less screwed than now, that's fine. More. <laughs> Degrees of being screwed. Well, it's more because you don't have the staff you need to do the area you're responding to today. Right. If you guys are going to say that I'm going town wide, you know, by March, and I don't have a window to try to bring in officers um, as of like now, um, I'm not going to be able to fulfill the slots, and there's going to be a lot of shifts open. There's going to be a lot of coverage that's not covered. Um, it would be pretty de detrimental all the way around. Won't that, won't that always be the case, though? Like, any, any time we were going to try to make a change, if we wanted so, to do that? Yeah, I, I hear you, but, you know, you know, kind of going on what Trini was just talking about is, you know, possible, like, incremental changes. You know, if March 1 comes around and we're starting to increase our footprint with the latitude to try to hire, um, I, I think that's going to get you to where you need to be and say, like, you know, just kind of guessing like maybe in the next three years to have a actual staff equipment for a timeline model um, might be possible. Uh, but doing it all one shot right now, come March with only three officers, um, you're, you're gonna destroy the PD faster than you can try to rebuild it. And so uh, the other topic now that you're on the screen, um, that we heard at the public meeting and I've had a few people reach out since is why is the committee not looking at going bigger than Randolph to share the expense and get service to other areas and and I think it's a valid question um, especially since we know Chelsea's reached out Brookfield's reached out I don't know that we've heard from Braintree maybe we have and I just don't haven't heard about it but uh, Northfield's reached out and talked about like why are we both creating police departments and um, like, I think that's going to be a much bigger conversation in regards to contractual services or trying to pull a regional program out of nothing. Um, you know, again, you're looking at, say, just say, for example, Northfield, 
they just lost an officer. So they're at bare bones even worse than what we are. Um, you know, even in trying to combine forces, if you will, I mean, that's that's going to take a conversation between the both towns to try to figure out what, is, what does that look like. Um, you know, maybe we can do a contractual service with Brookfield. Maybe we can do a contractual service with Braintree. Um, you know, like I had a conversation with the captain of Lawrence County who wanted me to do a contractual service with Chelsea, but he only wanted me to cover nights and weekends. Um, Again, I don't logistically, I don't have the staff to even cover my own house other, you know, as opposed to another whole nother community um, where we would still need the latitude to start firing officers to fulfill those contracts. Yeah, I, I think the, the discussion that I've heard more is, um, you're right, it's not a overnight piece, but it's like kind of like the WERVA model, right? Like, why well, don't, X number of towns join together and fund service for all of them. It's basically like, why don't you recreate what Orange County Sheriff used to be? That's well, kind of I, what the conversation is. Again, you're going to need uh, officers on the road yeah. for you to even start rebuilding that model, if you will. I mean, if you don't have officers, you know, where people call you all kind of piece, you know, if you are down officers and you're only like pinballing, and now you're looking at a way bigger footprint, you're gonna burn the officers out faster than you can put them in play. Um, you, you just you need more, you need, you need more people on the roadway is what it looks and boils down to. Even if you open it up to a regional model or a contractual services or all of the above, you still need people on the roadway. Yeah, I just meant like, the, the thing was why can't you, why can't you have a decision for us to enact at town meeting day. And that's just one of the other pieces that keeps coming up is, you know, we talked about Rand them looking at Randolph for the energy coordinator position. Like they're looking at Randolph for why aren't you providing some level of leadership in how we, how we solve our problem for what we need to. And I'm like, well, we can't even solve our own yet. <laughs> like let us walk before we run. But that brings us back to kind of that phased approach. And wow. should our plan be to gradually grow this, including growing to outside of Randolph's yeah. limits, yeah. Yeah, right? Makes, like that's- That makes sense. And so that's why the, the committee is not gonna have an answer for you. We aren't gonna say it. We don't have, we aren't gonna be able to come in and say, we're gonna do X. Like we, we want you to, we think the board ought to do X. So I don't know that we know what X is. So, but I think we're going to will will the committee come forward with a recommendation? Though I, I, it sounds like they're going to come forward potentially with the incremental growth model, which as a betting person, I would bet that's what's coming. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I think that's exactly what's that's coming. That's kind of the sense. Like, I mean. I came away from the forum last month um, feeling that that might be the best approach and that it almost sort of seemed like the sense of the crowd too that they would be potentially amenable to that. Yep. Um, and it, it, it makes sense as you just said to build incrementally if we do want in five to seven years down the road, create some kind of a regional model, building to it in incremental terms before biting off more than we can chew. Um, well, Scott needs a, yeah, um, Scott needs the, the opportunity to, to build what he's got, yeah. right? Like right now we kind of slapped it together. <clears throat> we gave him what we could get a budget through for. Sure. Um, you know, what does that look like? What what does next year look like? And I, I don't know if we're gonna try to give you what next year looks like. And my guess is it's gonna be a beefed up version of what the budget was this year with maybe some, some different level of the outside of the district funding mm -hmm. there. Um, but it's going to be not a the it won't be the ideal, but it won't be the bare bones either. 
is what I would and, and, and also I'm just kind of looking for you know some kind of direction and I understand that you guys can't give me that tonight and, you know it's just it's you know where where are we going to see ourselves in the next you know year two years I mean hell I'm even looking for you know what's going to happen next year um, you know a direction and then we can you know try to expand or build upon whatever you guys are going to give me you know, if it's going to be trying to branch out and develop some other, you know, um, you know, contracts, you know, but that's going to have to be between the two towns to come, you know, what are they looking for? I mean, I can be that middle guy, you know, say, you know, and like, what are you looking for? What kind of services are you looking for? If it's an on-call basis of, you know, we, we need you at two o'clock in the morning and I have, I don't have an officer on or I have one officer on. That may not be, you know, kind of what we're looking for. I, I, it's hard to kind of picture what other communities or, or anything if I can't even fulfill what's going on here. And I'm very, yeah, we're, we're not even, we're missing the boat here. And, mm -hmm. you know, if we don't expand or don't build, uh, we're going to have more burnout than we're going to have a PD. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we heard... Um, we heard that the school is hosting a meeting, a hearing, and doing a, a community survey on bringing in a resource officer, which would be a, a big help. Mm -hmm. um, so, as, it, you know, honestly, it's going to be a help, but it's going to be a help that, you know, I'm not going to be at the school. It's going to be a officer at the school, but it's a officer that's not on the road. Um, sure, I could probably use that officer in the summertime to alleviate some vacation time for much to stress some of my other guys that are on the road, but, you know, they're kind of locked away in that, I mean, in that SRO type position. Um, you know, it, it's kind of like one hand and the other kind of thing. Sure, it's going to help um, where it, it's not buying me up on a daily basis, but it is buying up another officer. But they're paying for that officer in this model. Uh, so yeah, it's bringing another resource in, they're paying for it, and it's going to free up your time. Like, and it could help with some of these other things, right? Like some of the challenges you're seeing on the other side are the kids that are in the school, and you're going to school to deal with them, and then you're having to deal with them in the community side too. So, I mean, at, at this point, I mean, it's another law enforcement officer. It would... It has to be part of your department. I guess it doesn't have to be, right? Orange County or somebody else or state police could do it, but it makes sense that it's in your department. Um, well, again, you know, it, I mean, if they're going to fit the bill for it, and it's kind of looking that way, but, you know, we'll see what happens with the final budget that they put together. Um, you know, we're still trying, we're also trying to sneak a car in there, too, because that officer will need a, travel, a car to travel with him between uh, all schools. Because what they're talking about is not just the high school, but a district SRO. So that includes Braintree, Brookfield, uh, the elementary school, the tech center, and the high school. So they're going to need some kind of mode of travel to travel to those satellite schools, if you will. And um, we're trying to work that in as well. I've had a couple of conversations, preliminary conversations with the superintendent, but you know they really haven't gotten off the ground just yet. Mm -hmm. But it's a good, it's a positive. Like the fact it, that they're considering it. It's a step on growth and it's a step on the right direction. You know, I'm just missing the other parts and pieces of putting cops on the road. Yep. So that's kind of what we're grappling with. Mm -hmm. And then develop a recommendation of what to do. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And we'll find out Monday, like, where we're at with that part sure. of it, but. So just so you know too, I've had a few other conversations in regards to the social worker aspect. So more often than not, the social worker is not a substitute for a law enforcement officer. It's more of a addition to that officer. So if the, say for example, the social worker, uh, you know, kind of goes out and deals with the aftermath of a overdose, like we have heard in the past, that officer is still kind of tied to that social worker. 
it's not a here you go forget you you know i'm going to leave you at this person's residence or in the hospital for hours and then you're still tying up that officer so it's not a 100 percent savings you're still tying up those resources where we were additionally kind of thought that it may alleviate but through the other agencies that I've spoken to with the social workers that were implemented in their offices, it, that's not quite the deal. So it's, it's, it, we have to start, you know, we're kind of really kind of view it as it's not a supplement, it's a additive. And it doesn't really take away of the numbers that we're going to need to do a tell my model or whatever the model may be suggested. So if I'm hearing you correctly, you haven't actually gotten clarity from Clara Martin that they would supplement the cost? No. Of and as a matter of fact, they've been because meeting. Because Kristen keeps bringing it up as a. And that they get money from the state to pay for it yeah. and whatnot. But uh, there's a group that meets on a regular basis that Scott's part of and Clara Martin Center's part of to talk about some of the issues and whatever. Yeah. And, you know. It just seems like to me, if you had the money to hire this person and you felt it was that important, where were you a year ago when we stood this police department up? You should have been at the table saying, hey, I got money to hire somebody. Right. Let's get you a worker to help you. Yeah. But we still don't even have them saying we have the money to help pay for it or that, you know, we'll help you find somebody or like there's that's the part we're going to try to drill into on Monday and mm -hmm. better understand from. St. Albans, like, how does it work where you are? Like, what are, and we keep hearing from Kristen, like, there's savings, there's huge savings in these communities that have these folks embedded in their department. Like, where are they? What are, what are those savings? Is anybody from Clara Martin at the table at the police services? They meeting? came once, right? They came and gave it's, us that one. It seems like it's We don't use the services very much. You know, it seems like it's a straightforward do you do this or don't you? I mean, I would imagine St. Albans is probably contracting with someone, or do they have a... Yeah, I think I think it's a... Uh, but if Franklin, they were Franklin the original... Kind of were they the original story. one, Scott? That did uh, I think so, yeah. But a lot, if you look at forward. a lot of the partnerships uh, throughout the state, um, they're all associated with a social work or a mental health uh, establishment mm -hmm. you know so like the for example the royals and barracks who has their slot still vacant and it's been vacant for a year plus is slated for the Clara Martin Center and they haven't even put you know been able to find a correct fit for that barracks for a social worker or, a or embedded mental health worker but that person we could use too like it's not a you can't go out and hire somebody and give them full-time work because you may have three calls this month, ten calls next month. It's it's uh, right. It, it, it's not a cookie cutter. Like we're predicted to have five mental health calls, uh, you know, a month. And right. It's it's sporadic at best, all the way around. Yeah, yeah. we might just be too small. For that's we yeah, we are too small, and, you know, and you know just the numbers that we have put up uh, since we've been in existence, because we're very diligent in tracking, you know, what's a mental health call, what's not, and Jeez. the numbers are very very small. Um, you know, does it support a full time person? No, it doesn't. Uh, it barely supports a part time position. Um, but in a additive, and that's just calls here in the village, and an additive, if you look at a bigger footprint, i.e. a town model or a regional model for a tri-town or what have you, that may increase, but we're not there. We don't have that data set. We're just not there. Yeah. And then one of the things we've been talking about is you contract with somebody, right? Or you share an employee. Mm -hmm. Okay, for that service. Mm -hmm. There's no saying two people don't need it at the same time. Right. right. Well, okay, yeah. so we right. need it, and Royalton needs it, and the person's there's, on there's demand so for much, both. There's so much issue around scale, right? Yep. If, it was a, if it's a bigger place, then this, these yeah. problems don't yeah. even pop up. It's like we tend, we, yep. you know, here, yeah. we, here we can have five calls in a day or five calls in a month. If you're in a much bigger place, you're going to have 
100 calls plus or minus five every day, no matter what. <laughs> yeah. And staff for yeah. it. Yeah. But when you're talking about a social worker and wraparound services, I mean, it's not just the call. The call becomes a caseload of providing services to hopefully prevent, like, correct and prevent and get someone on a better, like, path, right? So I think that's, it's, we're not talking like, so you're right. I'm not talking like, you know, it's a five minute piece. It could be yeah. hours on end or days on end for follow up uh, with that client. Um, but, you know, you're also going to try to, you know, kind of provide those wraparound services for them to have that full time clinician as opposed to a embedded worker here. It's mm -hmm. Well, that in worker wouldn't be that clinician. It, it would be how can I bridge the gap to that clinician so that client can get the services. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. They're helping them make that connection to what they need. Right. Which they, is part of the reason to try to marry up with the <clears throat> Clara Martin Center, right? Because they right. have the folks there that can provide those services. Well, and I think that's going to be your start point is to have that kind of contract with, you know, so, you know, so you can say, well, maybe we need them for like 20 hours a week or what have you to start, and, but their other duties are within the Clark Martin Center. And then maybe they could even be on on call. I, you know, I, I don't know. But, you know, for our purposes, you know, they, they respond to the call, they help out with the call. And then they're done, you know, as when they can pass off to the uh, clinician that can provide that that care. You know, it's it's that gap, it's that bridge gap, where law enforcement's failing at it because we don't have the context where maybe this other person embedded in the Claremont Center or whatever has better context than oh, what we have yeah. as a law enforcement officer. Yeah, we've kind of gone beyond the where you need that licensed law enforcement person mm -hmm. into this other area. And mm -hmm. It's how do you get to that point where you hand it off? Oh, it's been a, it's been oh, an yeah. educational committee. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And, you know, police departments all over the place are grappling with this issue, yeah. whether it's in a metropolitan area or, you know, Burlington has certainly wrestled with it the last several years. Uh, um, Yep. And again, the smaller you are, the harder it is. Yeah. You can't yeah. afford it. Well, right? No. Because these issues are on scale. Like, yep. It just, no. there's certain things that you need to do, and, and, and it's harder to do if you don't have and, enough people. And, and to on their staff. defense, I mean, Clara Martin is, you know, kind of dealing with the same. I mean, they're they're trying to provide mental health services yeah, to oh, a largely rural uh, area. No, it's, and, it's hard for them. You know, I, it's not. Um, it's. And we have I mean, the same issues at the hospital, where operating a small hospital with small units is really hard to staff. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. And it's yep. just because they're, they're, they're so small. The only positive there is they have the, uh, like the traveling nurses and the traveling specialists and whatnot. They can bring in, they're right. expensive and right, whatnot, but, but Scott doesn't have that. Right, right but, like, but, it's, but it's, this, it's this idea that you can have a lot of time where there's very little going on and then a lot and then suddenly have way too much going on yep. and it's really unpredictable and it jumps around a lot because you're so small um, if you're bigger your your overall level of service compared to the size of your staff is much more consistent yeah, it's, statistically. Rel it's, it's relatively like flat mm -hmm. or you know yeah yeah where you, know, you 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 know here in in Randolph like you p take a particular type, like you, Scott could see twice as many calls one day than the next day. If you're in a big metropolitan area, it's not like you're going to go from 10,000 calls a day and all of a sudden one day you get 20,000 calls. That's just statistically impossible. They might go to 20,000 and 500 calls, but they're never going to have these wild swings that yep. we do just because we're so small. It's just, it's really tough. Yep. That's part of what the challenge is. Right, like so what? we have to pay, in a sense, we want, we really, we, what we really need to do in some sense is have a lot more staff <laughs> per capita um, than a bigger place. And so it gets, you know, if you want to be able to handle the, the, 
most of the calls most of the time, and that's so it gets very expensive very quickly. Which then takes you down to the conversation of, like, what should they be covering? What shouldn't they be covering? What are we going to provide for service? What's that level look like? And then that conversation goes all over the yeah, place. Yeah, no, that's right. That's right. <laughs> right, like, if, if it's going to be able to be afforded and you're going to get it through, it's going to be voted on and approved, what does that look like? What, and What are we actually promising yep. that voters and are getting for what, what are they going to get for paying their taxes? Yep. Yeah. Yep. And, well, you know, kind of what we heard, the business community would like 24-7 and plenty of staff, sure. so when they call, somebody comes, especially up at the barn, they were the ones that were like, we could use you six, eight times a day. So, you know, how do you balance that, right? And the rest of them are, you know, we heard from people like, I have never called the police. Right, I never it's called like, the police. I have. <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, I live in the police right? district. They're at yeah. my disposal, I'm, supposedly, but I, you know, yep. my neighborhood's extraordinarily safe. We almost never have problems. Mine wasn't for myself. It was for yeah. I'm just saying like, that's a, just that's just the common experience, you know. Yeah. I have the neighbor. You have the neighbor. <laughs> sure. Other than a portion of my neighborhood collapsing <laughs> into the river. Uh, uh, Yours is getting smaller. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not getting anywhere near me. All right. Right. Well, Still. I don't think we're going to solve this here, but that's well, what we're I, grappling I, with, I, and why there's no yeah, clear yeah, cut. A, it's, it's good to get but, this update as to what you've been wrestling with and have some more. But the goal is still to come forward with something. With something. For the next fiscal year. Well, we're going to have to. There has to be you some. You've got to come forward with a budget. Yep. So. And, and, and if we're expanding the district, you know, that's yep. going to be um, on yeah. the ballot, too. Now, I've had people express a concern to me about the idea of, of the incremental expansion. Um, a question of how many um, residential houses there are versus commercial businesses in the expanded area going down to the Bethel border and up to, um, and, and how that might impact a vote. I, I don't know whether that's a legitimate concern or not. Um, well, it is. Yeah. Right? We know that the southern expansion was voted on once, and the residents overwhelmingly turned it down mm -hmm. you know I, and I think that's a, a valid p piece of it right the the business community is clamoring for it they want to see it they want to see the area expanded they want the service the residential side isn't quite as vocal mm -hmm. in some of these areas sure. and and sure, then the residents uh, aren't calling the police right and you know at the barn they were telling us they've hired their own security now they'd like to get rid of that and have the police department go town wide and like well, the stories they were telling us you probably ought to have both <laughs> you know like mm -hmm. don't get rid of your security because of that because yeah. they got some crazy stuff going up there but there also probably ought to be some communication with the state police about what's coming off the interstate and whatever well, yeah, there. That's, but that's, you know that's I think that's a bigger mm -hmm. issue but I just wow. you know and the whole co the conversation about the the, what those lines look like, right? The Lister's office asks us not to draw straight lines. Sure. Well, so, does, so it's does it include all the side roads off 66? We or? took, and we went up 66, and we took every parcel that touched 66, and we included the whole parcel. Oh, okay. And so right. your line is like this. And right. then what we heard was, okay, so now it's the whole parcel, and so it's easier for the Lister's office, right, to, right. to figure that out. But now you've created a nightmare for dispatchers. So if you look, some of those parcels that touch 66 are actually over on Sunset. So mm -hmm. some of the residents on Sunset are going to have police service. Some of them aren't. Yeah, so that's fine. Yeah. So every time you figure one piece out, it changes well, the What is else. the current state of the uh, uh, Sheriff's Department? Is it still pretty? It's hard. It's, yeah. It's okay. just, it just got worse, actually. Yeah. Because it, their 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 budget for next year just got cut pretty dramatically. By the by the uh, by the side, side judges. judges, yeah. Jeez. So they're they're if they're in even they're, worse. Yeah. So they're they're a hurt unit, and if they survive the winter, I will actually be surprised. Wow. 
Wow. It's just but they're a, able to provide service in Chelsea, and they don't want. I don't know if you read the Herald this week, but yeah, they, they, well, they're not really providing service. I mean, they did a patrol today in Chelsea and still had VSP calls for service to go to Chelsea also. So, what kind of service are you looking at? Well, I was more. Yeah, I, think, I, I watched like Hawk because you know, unfortunately, it still hurts me to no end to see what kind of state the sheriff's office is actually in. Yeah, yeah. But the comment from in the paper that was quoted, <clears throat> the Windsor sheriff was brought into Chelsea to talk about whether they would be willing to go because they come to Tunbridge, whether they would be willing to come up and provide service, and the sheriff's response was. If you take a contract in my county, I'm coming to your county and take a contract. And I thought, <laughs> with <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, there is conversation. Uh, so Royalton took coverage for Tunbridge, uh, Royalton PD. Um, they do have an active contract with Loretta for X amount of hours a week. And VSP handles uh, the other responses. Um, Chelsea is in conversations with Windsor County to do the offshoot for nights and weekends. Where that sits, I don't know, but I, I think it's still in just conversations. And it, the quote that was in there was that they would look at it, but they were having hard enough time balancing the needs that they have already. So. Well, you've got two two agencies that are are kind of on heads. Is kind of what the gist of that is right now. Yep. Okay. Okay. Well, it's 9:30. It's a fun one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, temporary amendment to the Don't personnel policy the on the youth. Yes. yes. We've got a handful of employees that are not going to be able to cash out or use their vacation time. Generally, these have been folks who have filled in. Maybe one on screen who have filled in extra hours above and beyond <laughs> to patch holes. And so what we'd like to do, the personnel policy is pretty pinned in in terms of how many you carry over or cash out. We'd like to just broaden that because these folks have more than earned the hours. Scott's an example. Chris is another one. Short staffing. John Shangrao is another one. Um, and we have a few other employees that might qualify as well. Yeah. So we're just looking for some sort of temporary solution so that we can... Because otherwise it's forfeiture, and that's a really yeah, no, terrible thing. No, this thing. sounds like a no-brainer. Yeah. You just, we, we can't, we have to treat these folks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're making a good faith effort to, to do what they're supposed to be doing. We can't hold this against them. That's not okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. what we've asked and more, what we've needed more, so. Absolutely. Yeah. Whatever, whatever, whatever motion you need. Okay. So will. you're asking to allow them, because of the conditions, to extend their time? To, to essentially just, yeah, create a yeah. little, anything that they've accrued up through December 30th, let them sort of either carry over what they want to carry over or cash out in exceedance of the 40 hour the maximum that's yeah. basically in the policy. Yeah. Can you and get that through on the state contract too? Yeah, no problem. When do you want that by? Well, <laughs> every paid period I lose time because I've maxed out and I can't take it because of the shit I got going on. So immediately <laughs> would be good if you could make uh, that I'll, happen. I'll <laughs> get right on that. <laughs> is, is tomorrow morning too late? Well, I'll second that. <laughs> 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 huh? Just trying to get, get our legislator right. to help right us on. out here, Alyssa. <laughs> what, kind of, what kind of motion do you need, Trevor? Uh, to approve a temporary amendment to Section 6.5 of the personnel policy that essentially says for vacation leave earned prior to December 30, 2023, employees may cash out or carry forward vacation leave hours in any amount, notwithstanding the applicable paragraph of Section 6.5 of the personnel policy. <laughs> Temporary provision expires. I, 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 I'll, I'll make that motion. And there's 31 days in December, right? <laughs> <laughs> we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Manager's report. I don't have anything what's written other than anybody who wants to, had ever wanted to fill out an EEI request from FEMA. I have about 18 of them backed up, so <laughs> they're, they're not hard, but they... You just gotta sit I'm there and consuming. go through questions. Um, just can you give us a quick update um, on, unless it's an executive session issue, on how you're um, doing with recruiting for Kim's position? I could, yeah, it might be a good one based on where we're at with that process to kind of hang there. Okay. Once we'd be talking okay. about people potentially. Okay. 
Okay. Then the next one is to go into executive session. We have the fine that we need to. Yeah, just the contract piece that we want to touch base on, even though there's new developments, is a two, two-parter. So we can do it as easy as somebody can move number one and then somebody can move number two? The minutes will reflect that, so for sure. I will make a motion <laughs> that we go into executive session for the purpose of discussing contract issues, the premature disclosure of which could put the town at risk. So your first motion will be the finding that it's necessary, prudent, and the premature, and then the second one will be to enter. Oh, well, so you're doing number one. Ones? Yeah. Okay. I'll um, <laughs> I'll make a motion that we go into executive session. Well, that we that find right? it prudent. Yeah. We find it prudent. We're to finding go it into necessary session. first, and then we'll make a motion to go in. This okay. is why I never do this. <laughs> just so say you move just... you move number one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I move number one. Which I thought is That's what I just did. That's better than the next one, right? And then I... Uh, do we I'll, have a motion? Do we have a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, now you can move us into executive session. I would move that we go into executive session. <laughs> second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries, and we are off. Oh.